morning and welcome to Bloomberg Quint, India's first digital live streaming business news service. You're watching Indian Open. I'm Neerat Shah. Good morning, Ira. Good morning, Neeraj. And a very good morning to all of our viewers. Let's get you the headlines this Tuesday morning. Relegate wants the market regulator to declassify Malvinder and Shivinder Singh as promoters. That's a Bloomberg Quint exclusive. Nirav Modi has written a letter to Punjab National Bank claiming that the lender's overzealousness has hampered his ability to repay. Higher volumes are expected to aid Ambuja Cement in the fourth quarter earnings, which come out today. And in global news, Deutsche Bank will cut at least 250 jobs at its corporate and investment banking division across the world. Well, let's take a brief look at the trade setup for the day. The rest of the world is not uh, exactly a happy place. Some bit of uh, pullback across the Asian bourses. Remember, the US markets were shut. While just that the Dow futures ended in the red or traded red, Nikkei is down about a percent and a half, so wiping off all of the gains that it had in trade yesterday. Hang Seng resumes trade and down about a percent too, and there's ZX Nifty showing its hand, um, indicating a downtick of about 27 odd points. But keep in mind, we are already uh, there was a bit of a pullback uh, in trade yesterday and we may well start off slightly lower from that 100-day moving averages. And yesterday, it was all about the markets trying to defend key averages. Uh, the 10.393 level fairly sacrosanct from a trader's perspective. A lot of shorts already in the system and you've seen that, that the new Nifty OI hasn't changed too much. It's just a bit of a pullback in late trade. Considering its expiry week, you could well see these intraday moves very, very heightened uh, over the course of the next three days. The Nifty Bank too bounced off from those 200-day moving average levels. Uh, and keep in mind, the Bank Nifty OI was down about 5%. So you saw some bit of profit booking that would have come in into short positions that were already existing within the PSU Banking uh, Index and the PSU Banking stocks as well. I dare say a large part of the action happened in the private banks, which helped the index move up. So maybe the PSUs, the short position would still be existing, but the private sector banks definitely helped. Um, PSU banks continue to drag lower, they added fresh shorts and in fact if you look at uh, uh, three or four charts uh, over the last six months which is the Nifty PSU index or specific PSU banks, they've given off all of the gains that had come in post the recapitalization announcement. So that sharp uptick that you see midway, that is the 25th October uptick and in most cases but for State Bank of India, you will see that the, the ensuing downtrend has led to these stocks trading below the levels at which they were when the recapitalization announcement was done. So while that was probably a booster, uh, the, the following or the subsequent uh, spate of events haven't left a good taste in the mouth of the investors. Uh, do watch out for this pack in today's session too, as we will on almost every single day. Uh, just very quickly, two or three stocks to watch out for. Uh, th there are a clutch of mid-sized names, uh, some are meeting investors, so on and so forth, but I thought three that stood out for me. One of them was Fortis Healthcare, where it derived investments has bought about 26 and a half lakh shares. It's just about a 0.5% stake in Fortis, but rather Krishan Damani, uh, well, one of the biggest investors in the country, and they bought a tiny toon stake, but that got the stock excited, I believe, in yesterday's session too, and could keep the stock excited in today's session. Uh, Varun Beverages, remember we spoke to the management uh, day before yesterday, they painted a fairly optimistic picture about uh, how calendar year 18 would look like, and I think CLS is towing that same line. They have maintained the buy target with the target price of 885, which is a substantial upside from the current market price. They believe that the outlook for 2018 is strong as it's secured right for more territories. Remember, that is what the management was harping on as well. So do watch out for that. Last but not the least, I think we'll keep a close eye out on Tata Steel, Bhushan Steel. Speak about uh, both Tata Steel and Bhushan Steel in first word as well. But do watch out, there was uh, dramatically a divergent movement in trade yesterday for both of these naturally. So be interesting to see if uh, that continues in today's trade. All right, yeah, just uh, flagging off a couple of the stories uh, that we are picking up on First Word today. Uh, why are investors like Radhakrishnan Damani still bullish on Fortis Healthcare despite the turmoil at the top? Uh, we do an analysis of what it makes, uh, whether it makes business sense for Tata Steel to buy the two Bhushan companies and whether they're overpaying for them. Uh, and uh, we, of course, get you the latest headlines in the 11,000 crore uh, PNB near of Modi bank fraud uh, and uh, PSU bank stocks. Neeraj has already talked about that, but we'll flag off for the kind of hit that they have taken as well.
Okay, but start off with Fortis. Uh, that's a company that's uh, currently in the thick of news as well, with the promoters, the Singh brothers being in the eye of the storm. But analysts have a rather aggressive take on the hospital chain. So what's fueling expectations? What could have led to uh, Radhakshan Damani indeed investing in the business as well? Dashan is here with... Uh, some analysis, uh, Darshan. Yeah, so basically what we're trying to do is, despite all the noise, see what has happened with Fortis is that, you know, people are ignoring the core business and all the noise and news in terms of what the promoters are doing, what Daiichi is doing, uh, that is impacting uh, Fortis. So, uh, in the recent headlines, what has happened is just, uh, and this is outside uh, the core business, the Singh brothers resigned from the key positions, and then they were later accused of siphoning of almost $78 million. So these were in the headlines recently, as far as Fortis was concerned. But uh, the other important factor is that we don't know how they've performed financially for the last two quarters because the second and the third quarter results are yet awaited. They have not come out with them, uh, given the fact that there are different versions of what the company is saying and what you know some of the other uh, uh, people are saying. But now let's take a look at what's happening. Yesterday after the big move, the price, current market price is 148 and the Bloomberg consensus estimate target, that's the consensus of all the brokerages that have reports on Fortis, is 196. That means the potential return is still 32% on the core business of Fortis. So analysts still remain bullish on Fortis Healthcare. Now, if you're looking at what's working for Fortis Healthcare, first of all is the fact that, you know, there are reports of takeover in multiple media agencies indicating that they will be taken over. The proposed buyback of assets from RHT is taken as a positive. Most of the notes that have come out have indicated this is posi this po positive. They've already announced the potential demerger of the diagnostic business which will create value for the shareholders, but it's on hold right now because of all the legal issues. They are present in key geographies and, uh, and therapies, which gives them an edge over the other hospitals, and we'll talk about the financials of Fortis in a while. And there is operational improvement and higher occupancy because most of their op hospitals are now approaching five years, and post that, that is where they've started recovering the money. Their capex is, is factored in, and they will start improving uh, efficiency and higher occupancy. So that's something that's working significantly for Fortis. Apart from it, uh, now in terms of what is this deal with the Religare Health Trust. So they have bought in Religare Health, uh, Health Trust for almost uh, 4,650 crores. Now this value uh, and this deal simplifies the corporate structure because they are looking at a consolidation or consolidating all their India operations. Now post, uh, they get a lot of, they will post this deal, they will get in a lot of dividends. So post the deal, it will be worth anywhere between 3,500 to 3,600 crores. Uh, that is the outlay that Fortis will have to give because of the deal for uh, for RHT. Now, in terms of uh, the debt that is there, they will have to take over debt of almost 1150 crore. That's the debt that they will have to take over. And they will save of almost 270 crores annually in terms of uh, uh, fees that they pay to RHT. And uh, interest cost for Fortis Healthcare saving will be close to 75 crores. So this is what they get because of RHT. And what they get because of RHT is clinical establishments, 12 uh, Greenfield Clinics, 4, and operating hospitals, 3. So this will add to the muscle that Fortis already has. So this is what they get from RHT. Now the other factor is the possible suitors. And this is across uh, uh, media reports, especially the Live Mint and Times of India. So include uh, TPG Exxon, General Atlantic, IIH was one of the primary, Manipal Hospital, VPS in Healthcare. So all the names have actually come out. These are the potential suitors for Fortis. Uh, Fortis has already said that they would want to uh, uh, get sold over, but it's the legal Supreme Court uh, you know, verdict that is keeping Fortis uh, uh, you know, unsold. Now look at the debt situation. Operationally, they have managed to uh, reduce their debt. From 1200, they bought it down to 597 crores. Then the debt again went out because of certain acquisition. Now it's at 625 crores. At one time, the debt equity was almost uh, uh, three times. Now it is sub one. So that is something that is uh, working in favor of Fortis at this point of time. So broadly, if you're looking at the financials, uh, they seem to be doing well uh, at this point of time. Uh, any, any, uh, how does it compare valuation-wise? Yeah, so peer-wise, it is one of the most uh, uh, efficient hospitals if you look at it, at it. Now, in terms of revenues, it is the second largest hospital in India with revenues of 47. We're taking the FI17 numbers because uh, the others have, uh, Fortis has not reported their Q2 and Q3 number. So they reported revenues of almost 4,500 crores, only second to Apollo hospitals, pretty decent EPS of almost 9 rupees per share. Now, the other factors which we used uh, to compare uh, uh, the hospitals was basically the length of stay and the revenue per bed. 
five by far the highest as far as the other peer group is concerned and and the length of stay is the lowest so in terms of efficiency yes it's one of the best run hospitals in the country the other factors that we want to talk about is the valuation the cheapest uh, in in the hospital say which shall be the recently listed is trading at 28 times nara apollo is 23 times fortis is trading at an ev ebitda of just 20 times on an fy18 basis and comes down to even 15 times on an fy19 basis the only only reason that uh, it's trading at such a discount is the promoter related issues which if this gets solved they should probably get a better valuation margins uh, as far as margins are concerned it's one of the lowest in the industry currently uh, in terms of margins they don't score the others are doing well as far as margins are concerned so if you're looking at the other parameters uh, in terms of ROA ROE Fortis still has much lesser in terms of ROA uh, compared to others but but it's in line with what the others are doing uh, shall be because of higher operating uh, operating uh, uh, margins is doing well <coughs> but Fortis is in line with uh, has actually better than you know Apollo as well as Nara and Rodale so they're doing well as far as return ratios are concerned so that's the story of Fortis so I think uh, the only reason Fortis is not getting any kind of valuation is because of uh, external issue but the core business continues to be robust for Fortis well there are valid points as to why this would also happen I mean with, with all the surroundings yes, you cannot with, uh, you cannot ignore yeah. the surrounding headline news yeah we had a promotion level so yeah uh, so the operationally operationally the picture looks okay so if indeed they can get out of this muck that they are in and you know I, I don't know if yeah, it's so possible to say why when would this happen in the I first place I don't think you all. should even attempt it uh, I, I don't think it's you know it's sort of it's study foolhardy to say that this is all going to go okay and you know everything will get resolved and the operations will be the only thing that matters when mm. you know at a company at a promoter level when there are so many issues I think investors have to weigh both the operational performance and those promoter level issues it mm. would be foolhardy to do anything else yeah that's why, why why would people be talking about I mean why would Radha Krishnan Damani be for example interested in this is it essentially buying a well-run asset at a valuation and taking a little yeah, bit of so, a risk so, because so, it's a tiny tune investment to be honest. It's a tiny tune investment no doubt and, and not only <coughs> Radha Krishnan Damani even Rakesh Junjunwala has a stake and in all probability they know much uh, more analysis than probably we, we've done but but the fact is that you know it, it's uh, operational uh, it's, it's the uh, noise that is actually weighing down on the valuations of what is what the steps that they've taken recently are on the positive light in terms of what they're doing with RHT and with with uh, with the takeover if the supreme court allows there you know probably uh, uh, that, that uh, i am not saying that we should buy or sell the stock but I, what yeah. we are trying to say is the fact that you know uh, operationally fortis is not a bad run hospital it's just that the noise that is covering uh, uh, the, the stock price yeah standard disclosure out here uh, nothing that we do on the editorial side is any by any means uh, a recommendation to look at a stock please do consult your financial advisors before you take any kind of a call on buying or selling a stock merely trying to present out here the picture uh, operationally or otherwise as the case may be with different companies. All right, and there's more news on Fortis uh, also on our website, so do go there. Uh, let's move on to uh, the other story we've been tracking for the last couple of days, and this is uh, on Tata Steel's uh, resolution plan for Bhushan Group companies. Now, Tata Sun's chairman, N. Chandrasekharan, wants the $100 billion conglomerate to have fewer but stronger companies. Tata Steel's latest bid for the two Bhushan Group companies may be in keeping with that philosophy. While investors don't seem particularly impressed with the amount that the steelmaker is willing to pay for these two companies, uh, it will help uh, Tata Steel consolidate its position in Eastern India in particular. Uh, Nikki Meer Chandani has done detailed analysis on the pros and the cons, uh, joining us with that analysis. Nikki, good morning. Thank you, Ira, for that. Uh, well, definitely the aggressive bidding seems to be on the higher valuation, has demanded a higher valuation for the company. Uh, Bhushan Steel with a bid amount of 45,000 crore uh, and the derive EBITDA of around 5,040 crore uh, sits with an EV to EBITDA, comes to an EV to EBITDA of 8.9 times. And for Bhushan Power and Steel uh, with the bid amount of 24,500 and the derive EBITDA of around 2,250, we are sitting with an EV to EBITDA. The multiple comes to around 11 times. Now, this multiple compares to the industry average multiple of 6.5 times and also 4.5 times that we've seen for Tata Steel. So definitely this seems to be at a premium, out, uh, not only just for the industry average, but also Tata Steel. But will that weigh on the financials of the company? Will that have an impact on the balance sheet? Let's understand that. Now, if you look at the financials of the company, the currently uh, the company is sitting with a debt of 75,921 crore. This is as per December 2017. Cash 
cash uh, is around 12,000. The cost of acquisition of both these assets is 69,500. Now, even if you take a 8% per rate of interest and take that as a complete isolation figure and you'll get a debt of around the interest that the company needs to pay is around 5,600. Now, the EBITDA is at a good 7,000 odd crore. So even then, it doesn't weigh on the financial because it's a profit-making venture that we understand. Okay, and what about what are analysts saying? Does it make business sense for Tata Steel to go out and pay such high valuations for an asset like Bushin Steel? And you know, this is not the only capacity there. I think there is a, an ability that Tata Steel would have to enhance the capacity at Bushin Steel to Nikki. Sure, uh, that's one catch behind it. Uh, why most of the analysts feel that such kind of premium valuation has been demanded. But uh, having said that, to give a little positive picture of what this acquisition actually means, now Tata Steel is present in East. Uh, it's got a major presence there. It, 10 MTPA plant in Jamshedpur, 3 MTPA in East. Both are in East, and Bushan Steel and Bushan Steel in Power. Now both of these plants operate in Orisha, and they're also a part of your Eastern Zone. So with this kind of acquisition, it's just consolidating the overall hold. But then the addition of these two capacities, that is 2.5 to 5.6 to your 13 MTPA goes to a sum of around 21.1 MTPA. Now this, if you compare that with the other players like GSW Steel, which is present in both West and South, they're operating with a capacity of 18 MTPA. Sale, which is East, South and Central, is sitting with a capacity of 14.5 uh, MTPA, which by FI19 will be 21.5. So it's going to be a neck-in-neck -neck competition for both Bushan as well as Sale. But uh, the last point that I'd like to make is the kind of product mix that the company would see. If you see the company sitting with uh, a portfolio of 72% in its overall uh, product mix, uh, and this it will further consolidate its uh, product position in flat products, given that Bushan Steel is mainly into flats, and Bushan Power and Steel is a mix of both flat as well as long products. All right, Nikki. Thanks so much for that. That's Tata Steel, and of course, lenders still have to agree upon uh, the actual bid, uh, even though it is higher than GSW. Uh, let's move on to PNB and uh, what's happening in Punjab National Bank. A whole bunch of news coming out yesterday as well. So first, let's get you up to speed with that. Uh, the uh, evening news that came through was that three other officials have been arrested at uh, Punjab National Bank. Uh, the officials arrested have been from the Brady House branch. Uh, two of them worked in the Forex Department, and sources from the CBI suggested uh, to reporters uh, that they were uh, fully aware of what Mr. Shetty was doing. Uh, the third official is from the export uh, department uh, and was also apparently in the know of what was going on. The total number of arrests in the case now stand at 6-5 from PNB and one official who was acting on behalf of Nirav Modi's companies. Uh, meantime, Nirav Modi has shot off another uh, uh, letter to Punjab National Bank claiming that the overzealousness of the bank has reduced his ability to repay. Uh, the fact that he can say that uh, and uh, you know say that seriously will perhaps uh, raise the question of how promoters deal with lenders. Uh, but nevertheless, that letter went out uh, from uh, Nirav Modi to Punjab National Bank late yesterday as well. Uh, Punjab National Bank issued another clarification, uh, assuring that it has enough resources to meet its client needs uh, and uh, added that uh, there is no shortage of resources and arrangements for their regular banking transactions, uh, that customers will not be inconvenienced. Uh, also, uh, they said uh, that uh, they uh, do not need any immediately new capital uh, from the government. In fact, government sources also clarified to Bloomberg Quint that PNB has not asked for any additional capital as of now. Remember, they were given about 5,000 odd crores as part of the recapitalization plan. A lot of people have conjectured, or at least uh, you know, some analysts have conjectured that uh, you may see PNB asking for more capital if they have to pay up the entire 11,000 crore uh, in one or two quarters. But as of now, the government saying that PNB has not approached it uh, for more capital. The uh, final development uh, worth tracking in this is that the finance ministry has shot off a letter to the Reserve Bank of India uh, seeking its view on lapses, but also asking how those lapses actually went unnoticed given that the Reserve Bank of India uh, does fairly widespread supervisory work on the banking sector and that of course uh, is an indication of uh, the back and forth that will now start on who is to blame for this uh, scam uh, and why it went unnoticed for so long you know I think that's that's the really interesting part right because um, all through the last five or six days that this has come about um, the question mark is uh, uh, you know the shit rests on whose porch 
And now the government and then the finance ministry asking the Reserve Bank of India to give clarification seems to suggest that there is an attempt to, I don't, I'm not saying passing the buck, but seek clarification from the Reserve Bank of India as being the principal uh, overbearing authority uh, under whose uh, presence all of these was committed and maybe it's the RBI's fault or otherwise. Well, it's the fault of everybody, right? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it's the fault of the bank, uh, the you know primary bank, which is PNB. It is the fault of all the other banks which were lending against these LOUs without doing enough due diligence. It is certainly the fault of, fault of uh, the RBI supervisory department, which should have caught this. Uh, and it is also the fault of the government by virtue of being the owner of these banks. Yeah. Uh, so it's tough to find somebody you can't point a finger at in some way or the other. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think the two sort of material developments that are important is PNB saying that we have resources. Uh, by the way, we, uh, you know, since we are on the issue, uh, I got a little bit more clarity from uh, a source that we were speaking to for another story that we've done on bias credit on how this will get balanced out for uh, the individual banks when the quarter gets reported. Uh, so. PNB, for PNB, this is a liability. So this will be on the liability side of the book. So it will not show as an NPA. It is not an asset. It is a liability. So they will have to provision against the liability mm. uh, on the assumption that they have to pay it out fairly shortly. Uh, for the other banks which have advanced based on these LOUs, and for them this is on their advances side of the book, they will show this as an NPA. Uh, and I think an interesting question being raised is that who is that NPA booked against? Is it booked against Nirav Modi's companies or, or PNB? PNB. Uh, so, you know, it should be interesting to see how banks actually deal with this as well going forward. And by the way, I, I think Ida wrote uh, a piece yesterday on, and which is there on the website as to, as well, as to how this, the, the whole modus operandi, if I can use that term, Ida, is possible in the first place. Yeah, the whole bias credit issue, I think it's a very interesting issue. Bias credit is at the center of this whole thing. Now, apparently it's a very common instrument used across the world, but the way in which India uses it uh, is not that common. Uh, so yeah, if you go read that piece, you'll get a sense of you know why bias credit has been so prevalent uh, and the very obvious flaws uh, in the product in retrospect, of course. <laughs> yeah. But well, uh, so do visit www.bloombergquin.com for that. As also, Nikki's piece on Tata Steel and uh, uh, the whole rationale behind Tata Steel being doing such an aggressive bid. I'm sure in due course of time in the day, Darshan will have a piece on Fortis Healthcare and just the pure fundamentals as they stand right now. Remember, not a recommendation by any stretch of imagination. But um, that's one uh, piece. Uh, keep in mind, I mean, while we are on the uh, uh, topic of the PSU banks, uh, that 2.11 lakh crore bank recapitalization plan was looked upon as a much needed booster shot for the PSU banks and past worries were quickly forgotten by investors uh, through the last three months of 2017. But just when things were looking like they'll be looking up for the state lenders, this PNB fraud has come at a rude shock uh, and really dampened the sentiment. Uh, the top the market cap, combined market cap of the top 12 public sector banks has dropped by more than 1 lakh crores from the peak. Yatin has done some math throughout the exact market cap erosion of these 12 banks and who lost how much. Uh, and what has it cost the two most prominent shareholders, the government and the Life Insurance Corporation of India. Yatin, good morning. Uh, good morning, Neeraj. And as you were mentioning, 1 lakh crore is the price probably the government paid uh, uh, you know, uh, as far as uh, various uh, asset quality issues uh, with the banks are concerned, and not only that, now uh, since uh, the PNB scam uh, is in the news, uh, we have seen additional pressure coming in on the price performance of most of these PSU banks. In fact, I was analyzing the Nifty PSU Bank Index, in which all the 12 constituents uh, since uh, the recapitalization was announced, uh, you know, have seen a significant amount of value erosion. In fact, uh, you know, SBA tops the chart. Uh, of course, the sh shares have fallen nearly 18% uh, from the peak, but given the fact that the sheer size is so large, uh, the total quantum of the market capitalization loss for SBI alone is close to 50,000 crores, nearly 50% of what we are talking about. And since the government and the LIC hold nearly two-thirds of the bank, uh, you know, nearly uh, 32,000 crores are attributable uh, to both LIC as well as the government of India. Now, if you look at uh, companies like uh, you know PNB, uh, the government in, uh, government of India holding is quite low. So the quantum of uh, losses uh, 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 relatively is quite low. Uh, but if you look at it, uh, you know the kind of market capitalization loss and the kind of negative returns that the company has generated, it's almost 42 percent down from the recent peak that it make, made the post. The government announced that 2.11 lakh crore. Uh, fund infusion. In fact, if you look at uh, the 
uh, all 12 constituents, they are in the red. Uh, from SBI to IDBI, Indi uh, Indian Bank, Syndicate Bank, Allahabad Bank, OBC, all of these banks are down. And cumulatively, the total losses are a little over, uh, you know, 1 lakh crore. Uh, in fact, the government share of the loss is close to 60,000 crores, uh, they being the majority shareholder. And that is, the, that is nothing different for a, a shareholder like LIC, which is probably the largest institutional investor uh, in most of these PSU banks. And put together, uh, basically, government of India plus LIC, uh, the losses are as high as, uh, you know, 70,000 crores from the recent peak. So that is the kind of market cap erosion uh, that we have seen and recently all of these banks also uh, had a preferential issue to the government of India and LIC in order uh, to improve their uh, you know capital requirement uh, so total total uh, the government uh, and LIC both put together uh, see a uh, mark to market loss of uh, nearly uh, 10 billion dollars as far as uh, the PSU bank mess is concerned uh, especially if you calculate it uh, a day after the you know mega recapitalization plan was announced by the government of India somewhere in end of uh, October 2017 yeah, so part of this could be attributable in the recent past five or six days uh, really to this PNB fraud. But otherwise, the sentiment uh, really post that big uh, bank announcement that came in was always down. In fact, almost every institutional investor I remember that I spoke to said that, you know, show it in the print. This recap is fine, but let it come in the print to and the then we'll think of buying. There was likes of Credit Suisse, which had turned positive. In fact, Credit Suisse was one of the few who had turned positive on PSU banks quite early. And I saw some flashes of Neelkan Mitra's latest report. I haven't seen the whole report. Uh, but, uh, you know, he's talking about a whole host of other sectors uh, where he remains positive or overweight or underweight. But I have I didn't see, um, you know, public sector bank being mentioned. So I think there were a couple of large people who were quite positive on it. CLSA uh, wrote about the fact that this is a large size uh, recapitalization plan should allow the sector to perhaps start turning about credit suites wrote about it as well uh, so I mean I think uh, some of the institutional investors probably misread this too yeah so one the advisors to the investors themselves a clutch of mutual funds domestic mutual funds and large ones at that bought in uh, on the day of uh, the uptick that happened and they've, they've been caught on the wrong foot uh, sadly so though you could argue that these are long-term investors at some point of time will come back but hey they would have had a chance so is to the government in LIC yeah. in that case yeah, I guess so. <laughs> so yeah it's it's turned to be a case of sour grapes but you could partly blame uh, the last six days what's happened because of PNB but I think the sentiment had uh, started to turn around ever since day one because some people believe that this will lead to that much needed re-rating and a lot of other people believe that you know, show me the print and then we'll think about it. Sadly, the print hasn't come about till now. But that's all that we have on first word for the day today at least. Uh, lots more on this. Some of these discussions will be carried forward a bit later on and we'll discuss uh, market valuations and fundamentals with Pramod Gubbi of Ambit Capital. We'll ask him if Ambit has, uh, what did it turn positive post recap and finally is it turning negative yet again if at all. Uh, we'll talk about Religare's attempt at getting its house in order with the company's independent director Vikram Talwar uh, and a couple of other corporate conversations but all of that's coming up a bit later for now we take a break and come back with full tilt towards the day's trade. डबल आनंद हम्म पहला आनंद पॉलिसी टर्म के अंत पर मेचोरिटी क्लेम का पूरा भुगतान और दूसरा आपके अपनों के लिए लाइफ कवर की पूरी रकम बिना किसी प्रीमियम के एल न्यू जीवन आनंद आनंद ही आनंद सॉरी आई एम लेट क्या हुआ कुछ नहीं यार जस्ट वर्किंग ऑन माय एक्सपेंशन प्लान फंडिंग का चक्कर इट इज सो फ्रस्ट्रेटिंग I feel like banging my head against the wall. No, no, don't bang your head. Cross the bridge instead. Bridge? Huh? Yeah, there. La. Are. This bridge gets you in touch with interested investors. Funding happens, which means more outlets, more customers. Interesting. And what exactly is this bridge? A stock exchange created for your kind of company. Just list on it and help your business expand. Really? Yeah. तो फिर लिस्ट कर लू और क्या शुभ काम में देर किस बात की चल एन एस सी मर्च साथ हमारा सफलता आपकी दी एस एम ई ग्रोथ प्लेटफॉर्म फ्रॉम इंडिया लॉजेस्ट स्टॉक एक्सचेंज 
मीट मिसेज मेहता इन्होंने नो रूम रेंट कैपिंग वाला आई सी आई सी आई लॉम्बार्ट कम्प्लीट हेल्थ इंश्योरेंस नहीं लिया और जा पहुँची ब्रोकर बबलू के बिल्कुल बराबर स्टील का बे जल्दी जल्दी मैं इधर ने हरणिया का इलाज कराने आया हूँ अगर तूने ये शेर नहीं बेचा ने तो मेरे को बाईपास कराना पड़ेगा अबे अरे स्टील आओ सीमेंट ये पेमेंट नहीं अबे सीमेंट डूबा तेरे को बोकर किसने बनाया अबे रूम शेयरिंग की टेंशन नहीं इंश्योरेंस लीजिए आई सी आई सी आई लॉम्बार्ट कम्प्लीट हेल्थ इंश्योरेंस देता है हेल्थ कवर के साथ साथ नो रूम रेंट कैपिंग का बेनिफिट भी ताकि आपको मिले अपनी मर्जी का रूम और सुकून आई सी आई सी आई लॉम्बार्ट कम्प्लीट हेल्थ इंश्योरेंस टेंशन नहीं इंश्योरेंस लीजिए वाइट शर्ट कितने प्लेन और सिंपल फॉक्स एंड प्लेन और सिंपल व्हाइट शर्ट को बना दे स्पेशल और फैशनेबल फॉक्स एंड New fashion wear for men. Welcome back. You're watching Indian Open right here on Bloomberg Quint. Uh, pull up the Asian markets, and well, actually, the Hang Seng has been very, very volatile. It was down. Uh, almost 0.8 percent. It's back in the green now, so fairly volatile. The Nikkei too was a lot lower than what it is right now. Actually, not a lot lower, slightly lower than what it is right now. A bit of a pullback out there. The SGX Nifty, which was also a lot lower, is now about 16 odd points uh, off. So let's see. It promises to be a dull start. The question mark only is whether it will be weakness that will take over, as has been the norm the last few days, or could the last half an hour or 45 minutes of a pullback from the Indian markets yesterday. Uh, playing on the market's mind, and can we have a day which is uh, marginally better than what we've seen yesterday? Uh, well, actually, you know, let's analyze uh, the trade yesterday by taking a quick look at the derivative space as well and the action that happened in the FNO, space, FNO pocket. Agam Akili is standing by with the derivative setup for the morning. Good morning, Agam. Good morning, Neeraj. Well, the rollovers don't indicate a lot of interest in carrying over positions, at least as of now, but we still have three uh, sessions left. So when it comes to uh, the nifty futures, uh, as one might expect, uh, looking at a decline in open interest, of course, this is largely on account of the expiry week. That said, moving in terms of the nifty bank futures too, we have seen a decline of as much as nearly 9% as far as this open interest is concerned. But there is some weakness case seeping in, and because of which we did see some shots building in across the other series. Uh, that said, moving on, uh, uh, the WIX, of course, did climb by as much as 2%, but not as high as it was uh, at a certain point in time yesterday. Currently standing at around 16.7, uh, but uh, no change in the put call ratio. Currently standing at around 1.06. The rollovers, as I was suggesting, currently standing at 22%. Uh, you know, we still have three sessions to go, so we'll have to wait and watch whether or not this number picks up. But for now, traders are, you know, relatively cautious about taking uh, and carrying the positions into the next series. Uh, as one might expect, given the fact that we saw the Nifty move down by below the mark of 10,500 or rather 400 and we also saw a little more writing in the 10,400 call. That's the one that we'll be watching out for as we move into trade today. Uh, no changes in the FNO band but uh, we are keeping an eye on interglobe aviation which did see fresh longs across series. Similarly, we also saw some strength come in for counters such as IDBI bank which also saw fresh longs across series. On the other hand, we did see weakness come in for certain other counters like Sun TV. So fresh shots there while we see an open interest increase across all series. Uh, interesting, Agam. Just uh, one quick thought on the PSU banks. Uh, yesterday, the pullback in the Nifty Bank was, I believe, largely on account of what private banks did. Uh, what happened to the PSU banks? Was the continuing of continuation of addition of fresh shorts in some of the key names? Absolutely, Neeraj. So while you know some traders out there are expecting a little bit of covering of shorts, it will not be uh, to uh, it will not be considerable. And be because of the, the the quantum of shorts in general for public sector banks, so we'll be watching out of that, of course. But for now, uh, there are plenty of shorts there for for shorts to be covered right now. Mm. Yeah. So the Nifty Bank, I think, predominantly uh, the pullback that he saw in trade yesterday. If you see yesterday's chart, was probably on account of the private sector. The banks having a bit of an uptick, uh, PSU banks, so let's wait and watch. Uh, okay, uh, in moments from now, we'll get in Mayuresh Joshi. Uh, he's fund manager at Angel Broking. In fact, I'm told he joins us on the show as well. Mayuresh, good morning. Thanks so much for taking the time out and speaking to us. Um, 
What do you think happens in the near term, Mavirish, to this whole PSU banking uh, collapse, if I can use that term? Because uh, the trader frenzy uh, has been there for the last four or five sessions, but there is only as much that uh, a, a space can fall in one continuous move before it finds some semblance of sanity and then people take stock of what next. Uh, when do you think that period comes in? Does it happen within the current expiry? And what after that? Morning, Neeraj. Uh, so very doubtful whether it will happen over the next uh, one or two days. Uh, but a large element in terms of uh, the contagion risks that has got pointed out uh, because of what has erupted out of the PNB issue is largely the kind of provisioning that a lot of these PSU banks will be mandated to make. Uh, they're already saddled with uh, aging related provisioning which will increase in Q4 as a lot of managements have put forth. Uh, add to that, I think the NCLT related provisioning is something that will add on to their credit costs significantly over the next two quarters. Uh, and again, I think what you're probably seeing in terms of uh, the entire mess related to PNB and also the telecom related stress, uh, which, which is probably very, very evident along with the power related stress. Uh, so again, the results are a testimony to the fact uh, that uh, stress is probably still there in the system. A large element of that would have got recognized, but further provisioning will be required, which tends credit costs uh, and the credit profile for these banks. Uh, but a large element, as you rightly pointed out, I think the markets will over the next few days uh, would like to watch in terms of what uh, progress is probably happening either on the case that is going at this point of time or otherwise in terms of uh, the asset related issues in general for all the sectors that I've mentioned, including power and telecom. But again, I think uh, any significant correction, my opinion is uh, bank like State Bank of India probably should hold out. Uh, Again, I think it's a longer term call that we are probably taking at this point of time. And though results have been extremely disappointing in terms of fresh slippages, my own sense is that uh, the bank will slowly move up the curve, uh, both in terms of reported NPAs, uh, as well as retail credit actually stay remaining very, very steady for the bank. So valuations have become very, very attractive. So yes, I think any decline, small proportion, a staggered way of buying into state bank is something that I'll probably look at. Good morning, Mayudesh. That's exactly, that was my next question, actually. Can we differentiate State Bank of India from the rest of the PSU pack? Uh, does it stand out? And I know that you did mention a weak quarter, but when it comes to the contagion with respect to this particular, uh, you know, uh, area with, because of which we've seen a lot of weakness in the PSU space, can we differentiate State Bank of India from the rest of the pack? Morning, Argam. Uh, so largely, again, I think, uh, if I go by numbers, on one hand, as I was discussing, numbers have been extremely disappointing. But a large element in terms of the management commentary of retail advances holding up, uh, and though credit costs might still remain uh, on the elevated side, uh, the bank is still very, very hopeful of maintaining NIMS because of the absence of interest reversals. The second element in terms of the PNB saga that is getting played out, yes, along with the stress that I mentioned in the power sector, in the telecom sector, you are going to see elevated uh, slippage is still playing a part on PSU balance sheets over the next two quarters, along with elevated provisioning. But that, in my opinion, should start flattening out. Uh, the third aspect that uh, makes state banks stand out from the other banks in terms of the risk uh, that has come through, not just from the PNB saga, but also in terms of what they probably recognized in terms of divergence, as well as the proactive systems and managements that they've got in terms of recognizing their watch list. Uh, I think that should hold good in terms of what they have reported along with their subsidiary NPAs. So in my opinion, again, I think any significant fall should capture a large element in terms of what the downside earnings risk for the bank might be. And to that bit, I think that accumulate uh, stands from our side continues because of its strong balance sheet as well as the leverage that it can create over the next few quarters, barring the next quarter, which is obviously going to be an elevated quarter in terms of both provisioning and credit costs. Okay, uh, Mayuresh, we'll come back to you on this one. But uh, for now, uh, what we do know is that the public sector banks uh, will, will likely to remain under pressure. But, uh, you know, let's go across to the re our, our research team and uh, find out what else we are keeping an eye on. Of course, there'll be plenty of stocks and news. We're also expecting, uh, you know, a very large cement company to announce its earnings and uh, plenty of other updates as well. So I'm going to start off with stocks and news. Shada, uh, what are we keeping an eye on in terms of the list today? So uh, starting off with Apollo Hospitals Enterprises now, uh, this is on the back of a report which says that HDFC is in um, discussions for a possible uh, MNA uh, 
discussion with Apollo Munich Health Insurance. Uh, the talks are only said to be in preliminary, uh, you know, uh, phases, but uh, there is no other suitor in the fray currently. That's what the report says. So let's see how uh, Apollo Hospitals Enterprises reacts to this. You also have Amtec Auto, uh, which might see a positive reaction. This is on the back of an ET report, which says that US-based hedge fund, which is Deccan Value, has emerged as the top bidder for Amtec Auto. The lenders uh, could face a haircut of up to 65% if they accept the offer. However, the original uh, bids were made below liquidation value, so this is good news. Relegate Enterprises have approved raising of funds uh, via warrants aggregating 916 crores. Uh, the warrant issue price has been set at 52.2. Vascon Engineers has signed the pact with Clean Ashar Foundation to develop a Pune land parcel Gayatri projects. Uh, we could see some uh, significant reaction here as well. They've done a reorganization of the energy business uh, which is being held by its subsidiary. You also have... Um, Vakrangi, uh, in a bulk deal yesterday, New World Fund and Small Cap World Fund exited uh, Vakrangi, while Martin Curie Global Emerging Markets Fund bought 0.7% stake. And we're also watching out for Grief Squatton, which will be uh, meeting a clutch of institutional investors uh, today, including Edelweiss, Kotak Mutual Fund, Green Lantern Capital, and Envision Capital as well. Of course, uh, but we're also expecting a very big cement company to come out with its earnings today. Nikki, what can we expect? Sure, we're expecting a good set of numbers, at least on the volume uh, growth. If you look at top line growth, is expected to be a, a good 18% year on year growth at a number of 2,584 crore. Net profit is seen up 43% for this company at a number of 252 crore. We're seeing a healthy operating performance coming in at 18.2%. We're expecting that at a number of 389 crore. However, margins are expected to be flat. Uh, volume growth, it's going to be, we're expecting a 20% growth year on year at a number of 5.9%. 99 MT as compared to 5.1 in the corresponding quarter. Market share gains in north and favorable base is expected to aid the volume growth for Ambuja Cement realization, however, is expected to be flat on account of weak pricing power that we're seeing for cement companies. EBITDA pattern is also seen flat on account of higher fuel cost. Things that we'll keep an eye out will be the volume growth, the demand scenario, the pricing scenario, and also the cost curve for cement companies which have been <coughs> on the higher side of late. All right, so, uh, well, we can keep an eye on Ambuja Cements as we move in. This is the fourth quarter of uh, calendar year 17. But uh, Adani Ports had an analyst meet, Samit. Yeah, it did. And what I'll give you the five key takeaways from that analyst meet. The first one was the company has announced capital expenditure of close to 1.2 to 1.4 billion US dollars to set up LNG and LPG facilities in two of its ports. Now, for the Mundra port, it is expecting the LNG terminal to be operational by June or July, while the LPG terminal, it is looking to sell 50% equity stake and is already in talks with number of PSUs to acquire that stake. For the Dhamra port, the LNG terminal is expected to be commissioned by FY21, where it has already sold 50% of its stake to IOCL and Gale, and the LPG terminal is expected to be operational by financial year 20. 19 and it is looking to sell stake to a global trader there. Now the company's annual capex is expected to decline to around 1500 to 2000 crore for the next three years from its peak of close to 3200 crore in financial year 2017. Now with this reduced capital expenditure and high free cash flow the company is also looking to increase its dividend payout. Lastly the company is looking to enter into new markets like Bangladesh, Myanmar and Indonesia and is expected to finalize at least one market in, in the current year. Now the company will look to form a joint venture for the container business while entering the, uh, this new geographies thanks guys for joining us and uh, you know giving us those updates about plenty of factors to keep an eye on but Mayuresh I'll come back to you on uh, the other company which has been in the eye of the storm recently and that is Fortis Healthcare uh, you know if you have any views on this particular company and otherwise anything else that stands out for you in the healthcare space in general you know, it's a large element in terms of uh, the promoter shares being pledged uh, and the promoter holding coming down plus a large investor probably buying into the stock uh, is probably keeping the stock in news. Uh, but to a large element, I think the overhang still continues uh, in terms of uh, the various probe that one is talking about from media circles. Uh, so I think I'll wait for clarity to come through before uh, I take a call on the stock. Uh, within the space itself, I think uh, I have been largely invested in Apollo hospitals uh, and the element here again is uh, pretty pretty simple again i think the kind of capex that they're probably doing uh, uh, the revenue per bed that they are generating the turnaround time and the key circles that they are operating out of uh, i think that does give some amount of confidence in terms of revenue growth uh, 
at the same time their pharmacy business uh, is probably doing well on the beta level the new stores obviously take time to mature uh, but i think the old stores uh, are probably doing very well in terms of uh, reported margins uh, so my own sense is that the kind of capex that the management has put forth over the next two years uh, the bed additions that they'll be doing uh, and the kind of healthcare facilities that need to get added uh, specifically through the organized sector i think apollo probably stands out in that uh, sense valuations a little bit uh, on the higher side in my opinion but again investors holding on to a stock like apollo should probably hold on mm. what about relicare uh Mirish, again, a stock that's actually 50% above from the recent lows. They have a change of board, an interim CEO, fundraising plans. Uh, how do you view this one? I'm not looking at this one, Neeraj. I think there are far better stocks, in my opinion, in the market uh, that one can really look at on declines in the markets like this. Yeah, no, which I agree. But is this a special case, and which is what I'm asking you, because they now have a complete change of composition of board, They're dealing from the Singh brothers as well. Uh, could there be merit? Probably, but uh, I'm a numbers man, so I think let the numbers start coming through. Uh, I don't mind uh, missing a rally in terms of uh, actual numbers holding on and the fundamentals remaining strong. Uh, and if there is a valid case, even after a strong rally over the next few months, uh, I don't mind getting it because then that gives me that added level of comfort. Mm. Okay. Which is probably a prudent call too. Remember, at 9.30 though, we'll have the management of... Uh, Relica, the independent director rather of Relica Enterprises, Vikram Talwar, will be joining in to talk about what's the way ahead. So if you are indeed wondering as to what to do with the Relica Enterprises and want to know a bit more about the business, uh, this will be a chance to do so, 9.45 a.m. Um, okay, uh, stay on Mayuresh. So much more to talk about. Uh, it's that time of the show when we do dive into technicals and talk about how to approach the market today. As we speak, remember, there is a bit of strength that is coming into the rest of the Asian markets as well. Let's talk about that with Hadrian Mendonca, Senior Technical Analyst at IFL, joins us right now on the show. Hadrian, always a pleasure having you. Thanks so much for taking the time out. Good morning. Um, Hadrian, I could, I could uh, you know, split yesterday's trade into two buckets. One, the first, uh, whatever, five, five and a half, six hours of trade, but in which were largely uh, lackluster and drifting downwards. And then the last half an hour, 45 minutes, the bout of short covering that we saw. What do you think uh, happens in trade today as a result of either of those two pockets? Yeah, see, it has been uh, you know terrible four uh, trading sessions that we've gone through. So since uh, 14th of Feb, uh, you know, where the PNB scam came out, what is uh, actually happening in the markets is what we've observed is that markets are opening uh, are opening with positive biases given the global queues. But then towards the end, if we notice, we are seeing uh, aggressive selling pressure. Uh, but, uh, you know, today's scenario is slightly different because we may open up with, uh, uh, you know, a slight negative bias, maybe on a flattish note. Uh, but then there are high probabilities given the oversold, uh, uh, you know, zone that we are into currently uh, because of the, you know, harsh selling pressure that we have seen in the past four days. I think from your on, uh, uh, you know, I should, uh, you know, just start uh, being a little more optimistic uh, uh, in a short term trade, uh, you know, wherein uh, the, the base case scenario is turning a little positive for uh, longs, uh, you know, uh, in the short term. So from here on, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, a trader should uh, start, uh, you know, building up long positions in the Nifty. Specifically, the bank Nifty uh, has very well held on to the 6th, uh, 6th Feb lows, uh, you know, that the bank Nifty has hit uh, close to uh, 24,813, if, if I'm not wrong, is the 6th Feb lows. So I think as far as bank Nifty managed to hold on to those lows, I think, uh, you know, one can consider uh, being optimistic at this level. All right, Hadrian, uh, but, uh, you know, if you take something like, uh, you know, the Nifty Bank into consideration, what levels would you be keeping an eye on with respect to supports and resistances right now? Yeah, so uh, as I already mentioned, 24,800 should be that, uh, you know, strong support uh, uh, for the Bank Nifty on the downside, whereas on the upside, uh, you know, the, uh, it is capped close to 25,500, 25,600. Oh, Adrian, uh, the other question I did have was the realty index. Now, that also has seen a lot of, uh, you know, volatility. Uh, I mean, uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure there is a lot of liquidity in the realty index itself, but any of those stocks in the realty index that stand out for you in trade right now that you're keeping an eye on that could have, uh, you know, possible implications for an upside or a downside? 
Yeah, so DLF, uh, uh, you know, is looking quite interesting. You know, the stock has been falling for the past four days. That is in line with the markets. But, uh, you know, yesterday towards the end, we saw a very good, uh, uh, you know, uh, buying momentum that we witnessed towards the end. So that has actually created a hammer kind of a pattern on the daily chart. So, you know, this is actually indicating that in the short term, uh, this should be a good bet uh, among the real estate stocks. Okay. And Hidrin, what are the stock ideas for the day today? Yeah, so uh, we are going with a buy and a sell both. So, uh, you know, first stock that we are uh, bullish on is Pedalite. Uh, the stock has actually held out pretty well. In fact, it has outperformed uh, the sharp downfall that we've seen in the markets. Uh, so, you know, one can consider buying uh, uh, Pedalite uh, at these levels for a target of 925 and uh, keep a stop loss of close to 883. Uh, whereas the sell, uh, you know, the stock that we are bearish on is Ujivan. Uh, you know, the, the stock has actually closed yesterday below its long-term 200-day moving average. And also the relative strength is, uh, you know, again, uh, slightly uh, starting to move on the downside. Uh, so I think one can consider selling uh, OG1 Feb futures for a target of 348. And you can play uh, play with a stop loss of 364 on the upside. Would, would the others like Equitas also be looking equally wobbly, Hedrin? Or is OG1 uh, looking slightly different than the rest? Uh, no, Ujivan, uh, you know, slightly stands out. You know, the weakness is uh, clearly visible in Ujivan. In fact, uh, Equitas actually uh, has kind of a formed, uh, formed a, a doji kind of a pattern. So I think uh, it, it is a bit different uh, if you compare it with an Ujivan. All right. And uh, how about Tata Steel? Uh, what kind of trade are you viewing there, considering especially when we've seen a 6% knock yesterday? See, Tata Steel is still not, uh, you know, hit the oversold zone. And I think uh, given the huge uh, red bar that we have seen uh, in yesterday's trade, I think the weakness might, uh, you know, uh, still continue, uh, you know, f from your on for another day or two before which we see a little oversold zone being hit. I think uh, uh, one can wait for another day or two uh, before uh, starting to build long positions again in, in a Tata Steel. Whereas if you see the overall structure, I think nothing changes. Uh, you know, uh, the structure continues to remain very strong. And I think if you if you are you know if a long term investor is waiting to enter, I think these levels are good. You should not wait for a day or two. Okay. Let's uh, go across to our special segment, Bloomberg Edge, wherein Samit Sarkar tells us about a pattern that the Bloomberg terminal has thrown up on a stock. And Samit, what's the stock on radar today? So it's Bharti Airtel today, and it's the MSCD indicator which has generated a sell signal on Bharti Airtel. So what is MSCD? MSCD is a moving average converges diverges indicator, which uh, sh which shows a relationship between two moving averages. Now it plots two lines. That is the MSCD line and the signal line, which help us in identifying turning points in a trend. Now, uh, whenever the MSCD line moves uh, below the uh, signal line, it is a sell signal, and when it is above the signal line, it is a buy signal. Now, I think you can clearly see in the chart how uh, the green line that is the MSCD line whenever it has moved below the signal line that is a white line the stock has seen a massive fall here and uh, the second time when it had moved below the signal line we had seen some weakness again in Bharti et al. So if you zoom in this part currently you can clearly see here that the MSCD line that is the green line has inched below the signal line thereby indicating a sell signal on Bharti et al. And what's the efficacy of the indicator, Samit, uh, if you backtest uh, this particular uh, aspect? So backtesting this data for the last one year shows us that if an investor would have bought or sold shares based on this indicator, then it would have given the investor returns in excess of close to 33% for the last 12 months. Wow. Okay. That's, that's pretty interesting. Thanks a lot for that, Samit. Uh, let's get in Shrikant Chauhan with his thoughts as well before we get back to Mahiresh Joshi. Shrikant, good morning. Thanks for joining. We'll take your index view in a bit, Shrikant. But since we're in the topic of Bharti Airtel, any thoughts here on the telcos and Bharti in particular? I think, see, Bharti is uh, falling vertically. And uh, uh, some two days back, it was close to 430, 435 levels. Uh, but there also after spending some time uh, and consolidating on the lower side again it uh, it has broken the uh, downward uh, pennant so uh, here we feel that it is heading towards the levels of 390 395 where the stock is having a very good support and even if we go through with the overall retracement of last two months then in that uh, basis also 
uh, 390.95 should act as a very good support for it. So I'm of the view that yes, we can expect some 10 rupees or maybe a 5, 7 rupees kind of decline in today's date, but close to 395, 390 levels. If there is any uh, like a, a, a really contra trader, then th he can take a call with a final stop loss at 390. Even if there is a medium to long term view, then I think close to these levels, uh, it's a strong bet to buy because here from here we can expect um, uh, at least. Uh, retracement of the entire fall which has started from 550 540 levels so in that uh, retracement we can expect close to uh, 460 470 kind of levels in next few weeks okay shikan before i move across to mayuresh this is just one more question on the benchmarks that is the nifty specifically if you could quickly tell us about the levels that you're watching out for and where you, how we expect that to pan out Uh, see the market yesterday recovered uh, sharply from 10,300 levels uh, and if we go through with the uh, overall trend of last 2-3 uh, days then the fall has started from 10,600 levels. So I am of the view that because the expiry is very nearby and concentration of option data is close to 10,300 levels. Uh, 10,300 now going to act as a very good support for the market at least for uh, a today or maybe one or two days max and uh, on the higher side again we can expect 10,000 420 450 kind of levels so for next few days i am expecting market to remain in a range of 103 and 10450 uh, 10, but in case uh, in the first half only we see the market is falling below 10,300 then yes furthermore weakness is not ruled out but in today's date my uh, strategy is to take uh, long positions close to 10,350 with the final stop loss at 10,300 and we can expect 10,420-430 on the higher side. Okay, uh, well, we do have news that ONGC is going to consider an interim um, dividend the next week. Uh, that said, you know, Mayuresh, if I can come to you on ONGC and your view here, uh, considering the way crude prices have been moving and your expectation of crude, you know, at least in terms of the outlook in the near term, uh, what's your view on ONGC? No, so there is a possibility, Argam, that the stock has uh, a 15-20% upside from the current levels. Uh, a large element of crude staying in the range uh, around uh, 60 and 65 or 68 dollars a barrel and the rupee dollar movement not being too adverse. Uh, probably a bet so NGC because this gross realization actually starts flowing into the net realization as well because there is no subsidy or under recovery that ONGC has to bear. Having said that, I think the management along with their CAPEX plans and expectations uh, of oil and gas productions being far higher than what we've seen in FY16 and 17 does augur well in a situation like this. Uh, the third element uh, in terms of uh, the overall earnings profile and the sensitivity that uh, ONGC will have uh, in terms of its overseas exposure specifically through OVL in a scenario where crude prices probably stay on the higher side uh, also assists the earning profile for OVL. So yes, whether there exists uh, a 15-20% upside potential from the current level, my answer to this question would be absolutely yes over the next 9-12 to 12 months. Hmm. Mahiresh, uh, you know, the other interesting bit is the kind of uh, pullback that's come into the large cap auto space. Anywhere between 10 to 20 percent for the likes of uh, Tata Motors, uh, iShare, Maruti is down about 10, 11 percent from the recent highs as well. Is this a P multiple uh, correction or is this uh, the broader market correction that has brought these stocks down but eventually will head back to those lofty levels? Where are you putting money to work, if at all? So on a couple of aspects, I think it was a case of both. Uh, we're earning the multiple probably on the higher side along with uh, valuations probably for the market overall staying on uh, elevated levels. So I think the correction that you probably saw in the markets uh, along with the weightage that these stocks have did get uh, an element of profit booking into the stocks. Uh, but I think the auto space is something that we will remain very, very optimistic about over the medium to long term. Uh, I think the premise remains very, very simple. Uh, I think specifically in the PV space, you're probably going to look at uh, a very reasonable amount of volume growth taking place. Uh, for the CV players in particular, I think the kind of volume growth that you had witnessed over the past few quarters, uh, I think volume growth should anywhere be between 8 to 10 percent, but the LCV part of their business uh, is something that will have an exponential growth uh, over the next few quarters. Having said that, I think uh, Maruti obviously remains one of our favorites uh, within the four-wheeler pack. Uh, within the two-wheeler space, again, I think uh, Hero Motocop, uh, because uh, of the expectations that the management has put forth and the numbers that it has been delivering, we can expect strong volume growth to probably take place. Uh, input cost inflation has inched up for uh, automakers as a whole, but realization pass-through 
will be very very evident and that leverage can be seen on their balance sheets uh, iShare is a clear hold with a disclaimer that we hold this stock in our uh, portfolio and again within the CV player I think Ashok Leland becomes a clear hold uh, because of the strong volume growth uh, that the company has exhibited and the LCB part of the business uh, that should probably aid to its earnings growth over the next few quarters. Okay, I'm going to stay on with uh, the auto theme and we have Mahindra and Mahindra which has decided to put in another 500 crores in the electrical vehicles unit in Jakan. This is of course on a fundamental basis. Uh, but Hadrian, if I can come to you on Mahindra and Mahindra, how it looks to you on the charts, uh, what kind of trend does it throw up? Yeah, see, currently, if you check, uh, you know, uh, you do a quick, uh, uh, you know, weekly chart check, uh, actually, at the current level, uh, the week is still not closed. In fact, just begun. Uh, but, uh, you know, early signs are that it has already broken uh, the short-term trend. Uh, but, you know, the, the whole week is yet to play out. And I think if we get a recovery from year on uh, in m and and if we manage to close above 740, 745 levels on a weekly basis, I think, uh, you know, uh, the, the uptrend is still intact then. Uh, and, uh, you know, one can play longs in m and However, uh, you know, we have to be a little careful because if we do not uh, close above 740 on a weekly basis, I think uh, uh, one should use that, uh, that opportunity then to once again sell. So, you know, uh, the case is open for both the sides uh, at the current level. Uh, we'll have to wait and watch if that 740 level is broken or not. Okay. Stay on it in. So much more to talk about. The pre-open rates kicking in and all over the place right now. But suffice to say, we'll start off on a very, very flat note if there's ZX Nifty's to be believed. We'll probably start off at these levels that the Sensex is showing. The Nifty, slightly higher. Let's wait and watch if that indeed turns out to be true or no. Bring up the private banks. Yesterday, they showed up the indices. And let's see if Axis, um, well, ICICI, Yes Bank, HDFC, and the kind of rates that they are showing in the session today. These were the principal reasons why the index did what it did in the last half an hour, 45 minutes of trade yesterday. Looking to start off on the positive note, which is actually not a bad sign if the private banking space manages to do that. The PSUs, SBI was probably the best performing PSU yesterday. The others still corrected and looking like correcting today too. PNB, well, let's see if there is another 9% downtick. I don't know, yesterday the selling seemed to have ebbed a little bit in the first half, only to worsen in the second half for PNB individually. Let's see if that continues to worsen. These rates, while these may well turn out to be true, are probably indicative. Just a couple of other stocks. One of them is Religare, the other one is Fortis Healthcare that I want to mark before I hand it over to Wagam. Uh, Religare, another 5% higher. And Fortis Healthcare, another 10% after that big move. But Fortis has reasons. Remember, did I have investments? Has bought in 0.5% stake. Maybe that is what led to the stock moving up slightly and moving over the 10% in today's session. So a couple of stocks to watch out for. What else, Adam? Well, in the broader markets, I am keeping an eye on GSW Energy, which has signed an MOU with the Maharashtra government. Uh, and for now, it is uh, looking at an uptick of around 2.4% in, uh, in trade. Of course, it's a positive for the company. The other one that I'm keeping an eye on is Advanced Enzymes. And that is because uh, you know, the board has approved an additional in investment in one of its units in Malaysia. That's up, well, marginally higher by about, about four tenths of a percent. Also keeping an eye on Gayatri projects as it announces a reorganization of its energy business. Now this could be a big one. Uh, we will have to you know, speak with the management and uh, figure out uh, what this actually in, in, entails. But for now, this, this stock is also in the green by as much as nearly 1%. And uh, from the same space, we also have Godravri Power and Ispath, where uh, you know, the, the, the board has approved amalgamation of the Jagdamba Power and Alloys with itself. Uh, that's looking at a decline of uh, three tenths of a percent, nothing much to speak for there. And one final one that I'd like to mention here is uh, Yuko Bank, which has sought shareholders nod for, well, uh, about 6,500 crores worth of shares and through preferential allotment. And uh, that is actually looking at a decline of as much as 4.6%. So for now, some weakness. Of course, this is the pre-open, so we'll have to wait and watch and you know, see whether or not that stock actually eventually opens in the red for now. But uh, well, these are some of the stocks in the broader markets that we can keep an eye on. Okay, uh, before we move any further, let's go across to Samit Sarkar who joins us with the top brokerage calls of the morning. Samit. Uh, good morning, Neeraj. On the top brokerage calls for the day, first we have a CLSA on Varun Beverages. Now the brokerage has maintained its buy rating on the stock with a target price of 885. 
And according to the brokerage, the fourth quarter of calendar year 2017 results were ahead of estimates. But this is not a relevant quarter for the company as the quarter contributes only close to 5% to the full year EBITDA. Now, however, going forward, the brokerage is saying that the investments will drive growth for the company and the outlook for 2018 is very strong as the company has secured rights for more territories in this uh, calendar year. Now, Warren Beverages control nearly half of Pepsi company's volume in India and also these new territories along with the uh, new products will provide opportunity to expand volume and market share to Warren Beverages. Lastly, the recent correction in sugar prices will help the company improve its margins going forward. Second, we have is HSBC on Balkrishna Industries. Now, the brokerage has maintained its hold rating on the stock and has raised the target price to 1,240 from 1,140. Now, according to the brokerage, the third quarter of financial year 2018 results have demonst demonstrated strong volume growth, which has also drive the earnings for the company. Now, currently, the company is operating at a 66% utilization rate and has a zero net debt. And going forward, the brokerage is expecting further demand pickup, which will in turn improve the company's return on capital employment. The company enjoys a significant cost and focus advantages in the off-highway tires compared to its peers, which also helps the company generate higher margins. Lastly, the company is expected to gain market share due to its expanding product portfolio, commissioning of efficient and new capacity, as well as because of its focus on high-quality products. Okay, thanks for that, Swamit. Uh, thanks for bringing us those brokering uh, calls. But uh, I do want to address Balakrishna Industries and see how it looks on the charts. Of course, we are, are very well uh, familiar with its fundamental story. But it's currently trading at about uh, uh, 1,141. And it, you know, it's, it's had a decent uh, 2017. And it certainly has kept uh, some of its peers behind. But on a technical basis, let's uh, you know, get in a view from Shrikant Chauhan. Shrikant, uh, what is your call on Balakrishna now and what would you do with the stock? See, the stock was around 1250, 1200 levels. From there, all the way it corrected uh, to 950, 960, which is a decent correction that uh, I feel. And uh, based on technicals also, the stock has completed almost 50% of its entire rise. So I'm of the view that now it is into pullback mode. And while looking at the overall, uh, this particular space, like Apollo tires or C8 and MRF, I'm of the view that this particular uh, space is the space which is going to do well in next few weeks or few months of time. So it's an opportunity for medium to uh, long term investors as well as traders who are like positionals to take some position at this price more on dips. I think 1000 now act, uh, is going to act as a very good support for it. So 1000 should be the final support for any positional long trade. And we can expect again 1250, 1300 in next few weeks of time. And in a very short span of time, uh, if we really, really want to uh, track this stock, then I think uh, this uh, 1100, uh, 1050 on the downside and uh, 1200, 1250 on the higher side should be the range where the stock can consolidate for next few weeks. Right. Uh, the other stock that we also wanted to address, which so you know, Summit took uh, the name of was Warren Beverages. And again, uh, there has been a lot of news flow considering the new territories that have been awarded to this uh, uh, company on dis distribution for its PepsiCo products. Uh, but uh, again, uh, how does uh, this look on, on, on the charts for you, Shrikant, Varun Beverages? See, VBL is uh, doing extremely well on charts. Uh, every time, whenever it, it like uh, consolidate, uh, uh, after consolidation, it goes to the new highs. Uh, the stock has spent a uh, similar kind of time uh, in the uh, in the month of June, July, and August uh, in 2017. And after consolidating a bit, it went to uh, new levels of 740. So after like uh, changing the range after 650, 660 levels, again the stock is consolidating. So I am of the view that certainly the stock is heading for 950 or maybe 1000 kind of levels. Currently, the stock is available at its lower boundary of the entire consolidation because the stock is consolidating between 740, 750 on the higher side and 620, 630 on the downside. Uh, yesterday, it closed around 648, 650. So again, here also, if there is a, a positional view, then certainly one can buy at current levels more on dips up to 620, 630. And one can hold on it for next few weeks for the target of close to 915,000 on the higher side. Right. So we, we have addressed uh, Fortis Healthcare. Uh, and taken a fundamental view from Mayuresh. But uh, Hadrian, uh, how does Fortis Healthcare look on the charts for you, especially considering we have seen so much volatility in the recent few, uh, re recent few days? 
Yeah, uh, definitely it's a very, very high volatile uh, uh, stock and in fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, there are no clue currently that, uh, you know, this is the bottom or not uh, or whether we are going to see any kind of, uh, you know, fresh up move or down move currently because the stock is so, uh, you know, highly volatile, uh, you know, it is not actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, forming any kind of uh, base nor, uh, you know, trying to form any kind of uh, a structure that uh, that will give you a hint. But if you track back the stock till, uh, you know, 2014-15, uh, 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 and if you consider uh, the lows of 2016 February, I think uh, it has once again managed to held above, uh, you know, hold above it. Uh, you know, the, uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, close to 142 is the uh, is the is the precise level that I'm talking about. In fact, if you if you see the lows of uh, um, November 2016, it was 142. If you see uh, the lows of uh, um, of July 2017, it was uh, close to 142. So this 142 is uh, is turning out to uh, be a very important, uh, uh, you know, uh, level that uh, Fortis actually adheres to. So as long as we are seeing Fortis LK above 142, and yes, of course, not uh, uh, you know ignoring the big deal that happened yesterday, I think uh, you know we uh, we we could see a good up move from year on. Uh, so uh, so on the upside, uh, the uh, you, you know if you draw uh, if you draw a trend line from uh, from its all time high, uh, connecting the the highs of 170 uh, in the recent past, I think there is a, a declining trend line resistance zone uh, close to 160 levels. So this move can extend to 160, and once we break above 160 we could see a fresh breakout on the upside so that's what i feel uh, from your on fortis definitely looks slightly uh, you know positive uh, because it is holding about 142 from there on we can play for for a level of 160 to 165 okay stay on it and so much more to talk about um, you know we'll ask mayuresh about a quick uh, thought on bushan steel as well because as the pre open rates have settled bushan steel looks like starting off the nifty 500 as the top gainer Eight and a half percent to 58 rupees in the current, in likely to be 58 rupees at the start of the trade today. But less than five minutes to go for the pre open for the open market opening. So let's tell you all that you need to know to stay ahead in trade today. Ambuja Cement is the final Nifty company which will report the numbers today. Radha Kishan Damani's derived investments buys half percent stake in Fortis Healthcare. PNB Housing, Greaves Cotton, Chola Finance and PI Industries set to meet investors today. And Gati Projects announces the reorganization of its energy business while Pratibha Industries lenders ask for a resolution plan. New World Fund and Small Cap World Fund exit Wakrangi while Might and Curry Global Emerging Markets Fund buy stake the stock 1.5% higher interest. And Relega Enterprises approves raising as much as 916 crore rupees via preferential issue. Well, so lots of stocks in to uh, speak about. But Mayuresh, one thought on Bhushan Steel. I think enough and more people are confused about why is it uh, that an aggressive bid like this would bring about such a response. We still don't have complete clarity, including the quantum of shares and the pricing at which Tata Steel would be. Uh, you know, coming in. Uh, but any thoughts here on on this recent development and the aggressive bid by Tata Steel being put in? So, as you said, I think no authentication for numbers, uh, but a large element in terms of uh, candidates like this, I think the equity valuation probably comes uh, very, very close to absolutely zero. So, I think the dilution is pretty stark in all such cases. Uh, so, I think one really needs to understand what portion probably is left out. Uh, once the deal is structured finally to the equity shareholders, that is the minority shareholders, if any, and what proportion probably as the deal that uh, is getting circled around in media of what remains with the lenders uh, uh, along with what haircut that the lenders will take. Uh, so a large element, I think, for the Bhushan stock movement uh, at this point is more in terms of anticipation than anything which is structural, in my opinion. If as well, Mayuresh, uh, that we finally have a bidder which is stable and a bidder which is likely to bid aggressively and the asset as has been reported number of times and that came out in the results as well as they declared for the July August September quarter weren't bad so it's probably a good asset which is now finding a good suitor at a good price well, absolutely I think so I think it's operational asset right from day one and even if you look at uh, Tata Steel's uh, plans uh, for Kalinganagar expansion I think that's almost 723 dollars a ton so what you're probably going to get uh, in case Tata, bit, uh, Tata Steel bids for it and probably gets through at the price that we are all uh, 
expecting in the media circles at this point of time. I think it's going to be an accretive asset from a medium to long term perspective. The second element is also the high steel, auto grade steel that Bhushan Steel probably makes and the plants uh, of Bhushan Steel are located very, very conveniently to a lot of automakers. Uh, so again, I think it's a high margin uh, steel product uh, that Bhushan probably makes and the captive use uh, of mines that Tata Steel has, I think that can also entail uh, the, to a certain bit the kind of cost competitiveness that it can go through. But the kind of debt that Tata Steel will have to raise uh, and the kind of interest that it pays along with the expected ROEs from a short to medium term, I think that set off probably can be a little bit detrimental from an immediate earnings perspective. But the medium term perspective with Tata Steel does get through, I think should be very value accretive for the stock as well. Okay, let's get our you know, top picks from our technical experts quickly. Uh, Shrikant, we'll come back to you. Uh, what are you recommending for our viewers today? See, I would like to go with uh, Reliance Industries, uh, which close around 927, 928 levels. Uh, here, I feel that the risk reward ratio is quite favorable. With a stock loss at 910, we can expect 950, 960 on the higher side. And I'm expecting a rebound in the market. Uh, close to 10,450, 440. So index heavyweight stock should be the preferred bet. And Hadrian, very quickly, we have 40 seconds less. Uh, what are you recommending? Yeah, so I'll go with the KTK bank. Uh, you know, three big rationals. First is a double bottom. Second is a hammer creation. And third is that big diversion that we're seeing on the RSI. So I think, you know, all these parameters actually indicating that we may see KTK bank, uh, you know, rallying towards 140, 142 in the short term. So I'll go with a buy KTK bank. Okay, uh, gentlemen, uh, all of you, thank you so much for taking the time out and joining us today and giving us your thoughts. Mayuresh, Hadrin, uh, as well as Srikanth, really appreciate your time. Market's about to kickstart. Trade will start off marginally in the green. The question mark only is, like yesterday, do we slip back into the red almost immediately? That's uh, the key question. The Nifty Bank flat, the Sensex about a third of a percent. Nifty is down to the Sensex held up maybe unnaturally by a couple of things or not being pegged down by a couple of banking names that might be present in the Nifty because the Nifty Bank and the Nifty are certainly off from the levels they started off in the first tick. So it's a very, very flat start. I would presume the same holds true for the mid caps and the small caps as well. Yes, very, very flat start. Wouldn't be surprised if the quantum of red is overtaking the quantum of green on the Nifty heat map. So that'll come up next on your screen. I would presume it's 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 not a strong trade that we're seeing. Actually, even Stevens, not bad at all. But look at the gainers, the bit of a bounce back by Tata Steel, I thought. Yeah, that's about a percent. ONGC is up about a percent. And IT, which got clobbered in trade yesterday, save for Infosys, is trying to make a bit of a comeback here. But a fair bit of red on the screen as well. No big losers, but SBI continues to grind lower. Adani Port continues to grind lower. And some weakness that has uh, continued to stay on HCL Technologies. That one is uh, the biggest loser. That was the biggest loser in the IT pack yesterday and continues to grind lower today as well. Okay, very quickly, two or three stocks before I hand it over to Agam. Uh, this is the heat map, of course, and more red than green uh, on the screen. But what about specific stocks at the broader end of the spectrum? Firstly, a large cap ahead of the results. The last index name to come out with the results, Ambuja. And it's starting of the day very flat. So no surprises there, no changes thereof. Um, there are two key newsmakers. Uh, one is Fortis, not a big bang reaction, even though Radhakrishnan Damani is bought stake, so not a big bang reaction, just about a percent, percent and a half. Uh, that's when starting off well. Redigare should be doing okay, actually. It's been on stock on an uptrend, another percent, percent and a quarter. They were not for fundraising as well, about 916 odd crores through a preferential issue. That starts off in the green. Last but not the least, a few stocks that are meeting key institutional investors and analysts today. PNB Housing, Greaves, Cotton, Chola, not too much of a reaction there. Agam, what else are you spotting? I'm tracking uh, Bush and Steel uh, in quite, uh, you know, our unexpected lines. We are looking at about a 2.5% uh, gains coming in early in the morning. Actually, it's come off now, now just about 2%, and it's reducing. 3M India, which has been in focus over the past uh, few days, uh, well, that has again gained. Of course, the stock price is uh, considerably larger. That's the share per, per price, a little over 20,600. 
Uh, we also have Varun Beverages, which has gained about another 2%, and that's followed by KPR Mills, also gaining around 2%. On the losing end, well, we again, you know, it's, it's fairly mixed, but we are looking at a, a lower circuit of 5% for Vakrangi. So, you know, it's been fairly volatile here. That's followed by something like a Bombay Rayon fashions, down as much as nearly 4%, followed by, you know, you know your usual suspects in the, in the public sector banking space, Allahabad Bank, Yuko Bank, uh, Union Bank of India, all looking at cuts, though the cuts are not as deep as uh, the kinds that we saw in the previous few days. It's followed by, uh, well, Edelweiss is perhaps a matter of concern here because this is the second straight day we are looking at losses has now moved down below the mark of 250. This has recently been the investor's favourite and we'll be watching out for more developments on this counter as well, Neeraj. That's interesting. Lastly, the rupee should come up on your screen. Remember, I think it's a dollar strength. Uh, yen too, viewers would remember, um, in, in, in trade has started off very, very weak. But the rupee is starting off very weak against the dollar, about 27 odd paise lower. So 64.49. Um, is this a trend that will uh, emanate over the course of the year, the calendar? remains to be seen, but certainly weak, the currency. And the dollar strong against a clutch of other currencies as well. Well, um, what implications could this and other things have on the markets? Pramod Gubbi, Managing Director and Head of Institutional Equities at Ambit Capital, joins us right now on the show. Pramod, thanks much for joining in. Actually, I'm starting off with the currency because you just marked that as well. And the dollar strength uh, for the last couple of sessions at least against a basket of currencies. What happens, uh, Pramod? What's the base assumption? Is it is it going to be a calendar of uh, dollar strength? And does that play on the mind of... Uh, investors who are looking at the, the dollar returns which have which were great in 2017 but because of the currency may just get balanced out in 2018 yeah i mean it's been surprising the way the dollar has moved actually since the beginning of the year it's continued to weaken um, despite prospects of inflation picking up despite bond yields picking up and despite the fact that much of the market has now moved towards uh, you know, four, four, per, four eight hikes uh, through this calendar year. So you should have expected the dollar to move up until now. Uh, but yeah, uh, I guess uh, these are uh, exceptional times uh, with um, you know, not market forces operating in the normal way. Uh, given interventions from various central banks, you can expect these anomalies. But I guess uh, the last couple of sessions is, uh, is a return to normalcy. Uh, you should expect uh, an up move. Uh, but the other thing to watch out for is the extent to which uh, the U.S. fiscal deficit will break given uh, the tax cuts and the expenditure program because that in the longer term will put a negative pressure on the dollar. Um, when I say longer term, perhaps a little over 12 to 18 months. So you will see the dollar appreciating in the first uh, uh, few months uh, as inflation and the growth numbers pick up and the rate hikes come through. But as soon as you see the uh, deficit numbers uh, breaking, uh, then the dollar should uh, turn downwards. But for all practical purposes, I think 2018 should be a year where the dollar strengthens. Well, the, if I can bring the focus back to domestic queues, uh, what we've seen is uh, well, uh, very, very good volume numbers from a lot of these FMCG companies. Uh, and uh, you know, as uh, many may say that a lot of these FMCG companies are more urban facing than rural. However, um, you know, to what extent would you attribute this volumes growth only on low base on account of demonetization? And to what extent can this be attributed to a genuine pickup in demand? I think uh, it's, uh, it's difficult to put a number uh, in terms of which factor has uh, um, contributed how much, but I guess it's a combination of both, like it's always the case. Uh, but yes, we are seeing a genuine recovery in the, in the rural economy, uh, helped by, I mean, look, it was bound to happen. We've had two decent monsoons after almost three or four years of uh, pretty bad uh, drought. So the farm economy is picked up. We've had decent outputs um, on, the, on the agricultural side. Uh, as well as uh, in the last six to nine months, you can see the government spending is also picked up in the rural areas. And it's only going to ratchet up as we head towards the general elections uh, of next year. So, uh, so far, based on what we've seen, I think there is an element of uh, pickup in consumer demand. There's absolutely no doubt about it. 
but I guess uh, the double digit sort of numbers have been helped by uh, a little bit of uh, a low base effect and also the normalization of the impacts of demonetization and the impact of GST on the channel, uh, especially in rural areas where wholesale was a big channel. You, you can see that some of that disruptions are beginning to get uh, addressed by uh, the actions taken by some of the leading companies and that should also contribute to volume growth uh, picking up. So uh, I guess we, we are looking at uh, a much better uh, um, you know, recovery, particularly for rural consumption over the next 12 months. Would that play out, uh, Pramod, on a clutch of uh clutch of spaces, I mean, size agnostic, uh, or would it essentially only be within the smaller ticket items? I mean, the broad sense that I'm trying to get it get from you is that while the commentary from the FMCG names may have been okay, would it play out for the other consumer names, be it autos, be it tractors, um, so on and so forth, rural housing, for example, because that will be a key trigger for earnings growth uh, for the BSE 500 space for sure. Yeah, indeed. I think uh, it won't just be restricted to the small ticket uh, utility sort of items, but also consumer discretionary. Uh, I think we'll, we'll see a lot of uh, demand. It has been quite healthy and driven by urban, but even in rural areas, you can expect pickup in uh, uh, demand for consumer discretionary goods, um, including the likes of autos um, and, uh, and, and durables and apparel and, and so on. So, I guess it will be a much broader uh, consumption basket which will uh, see this recovery over the next uh, 12 to 18 months in the run after the elections. Ramon, what about, what about the metal space and what did you make of uh, the aggressive bidding by Tata Steel for Bhushan Steel? Would it be a case specific issue because a large company wanted exposure to the eastern side of the region or is this indicative of the kind of buoyancy that exists in the metal space. I mean, Davos, almost everybody spoke very, very favorably about the cycle continuing. Are, are you in the same camp? Yeah, I think so. I think, uh, you know, the global commodity cycle is perhaps, uh, um, you know, mid-cycle at best, uh, could even be in, in an early cycle, but there are legs to this cycle, given that, uh, you know, after a long time, we've seen the global economy uh, working upwards in a concerted manner. Um, the U.S. is yet to announce its big uh, infrastructure build-out program. Uh, China is on a decent wicket. Um, early signs of recovery in Europe, although I'm not sure how much of demand for commodities and metals will be uh, dependent on the European recovery. But having said that, much of the globe is seeing that cyclical recovery and this should be a great time for commodities uh, in general. And having seen the sort of supply correction in, uh, in China, even the supply side is helping uh, you know, pricing, uh, which again helps uh, asset purchases like the likes of, uh, you know, Tata Steel buying Ocean Steel. So uh, while the global macro top-down scenario is, uh, is supportive, I think uh, there is also an element of uh, a specific uh, need for Tata Steel for this asset, uh, given its uh, geographic domain and, and that only boosts the sort of, uh, uh, or, or rather justifies the, the value that they put on buying this asset. Pramod, uh, the Nifty Realty Index has gained over 67, 68% over the last 12 months. And, you know, uh, the commentary out there is that uh, this demand for commercial as well as residential projects is still very lackluster. So what is it that the Nifty Realty Index is factoring in right now? Because even if you expect demand to pick up significantly, it will still be maybe a couple of years at least. Is, is that what uh, this index is factoring in? Um, no, I think the first effect will be more from the supply side. Uh, what it's telling you is that, look, uh, given the effects of either demonetization, GST, RERA, um, you will see significant consolidation in this industry. Um, this was a hugely fragmented uh, industry with several sort of, if you can say, mom and pop builders uh, across different markets, um, not just tier two, tier three, but even in metros, uh, um, several of these uh, small time builders dominating um, and partly helped by the sort of uh, not so ideal practices. And given the clamp down from the three effects that I talked about, uh, this naturally lends itself to um, to consolidation by some of the larger, more organized, uh, perhaps more pan-India players. Uh, and, and the Realty Index is made up of most of these, um, you know, market leader names. And hence, 
uh, it's a reflection of them um, taking uh, taking share from the unorganized, um, like I said, the mom and pop builders. Um, Demand-wise, I guess we are perhaps still, you know, 12, 18 months away from a proper pickup. Uh, we've seen some green shoots in some micro markets, um, but but in in general, for reality to pick up, you will need um, some sort of abatement in the uh, financial markets. Uh, people are quite happy uh, putting in their savings um, in um, in asset classes which have delivered over the last two three years. Uh, for that to get pulled out, you need some sort of correction. At the same time, I think uh, affordability has been a big question. Uh, we have seen significant improvement in that. Uh, three years of prices either correcting or not going anywhere, would, despite income levels going up, means that affordability has clearly improved. And once we get to a certain level, you will see demand from genuine buyers also coming. Um, so, so far we've seen the effect of supply consolidation. I guess going ahead, um, uh, we can expect some sort of demand pickup over the next 12 to 18 months. Lastly, what's your call to clients on, PN on the PSU banks, PNB and the rest, but what are you telling them? Stay away completely and if you have in your portfolios, get out of them or is it too late to do that action? I mean, we've always recommended uh, staying away uh, from most PSU banks, uh, even uh, with the hype of the recapitalization. Um, you know, we've always uh, set our eyes on, uh, on tangible reform measures, which several committees uh, in the past have recommended. And we've seen very little uh, action from the various governments in place. So until and unless uh, the, the governance practices, uh, the efficiency, the incentivization of human resources are, uh, are set right, uh, you know, we would uh, recommend staying away from these, uh, from these banks. Okay, down and out in the session today, the PSU banks yet again, 3.5% for PNB, the others are not too far behind. Maybe SBI might be faring a bit better, but the rest looking very, very weak. Tell you what, uh, uh, we should uh, take a moment to thank Pramod Gubbi for joining us today and giving us his thoughts. Pramod, thank you so much for being with us today and uh, sharing your ideas with us. Look forward to have you more often on this forum. Slip into a very, very quick break. On the other side of the break, we touch base uh, and discuss Religar's attempt at getting its house in order with the company's independent director, Mr. Vikram Talwar. He joins us on the other side. is full of options. Choose a job and earn on your own terms. Choose to become an LIC agent. It's more than a job. It's career insurance. Be your own boss. Be an LIC agent. Ab life set hai. Sir, 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 please believe me. I am in this business for the last 12 years. Okay, I'll wait for your call. Thank you so much. They still don't know you after all these years? Kya kare? पहचान ही नहीं है सिंपल सोल्यूशन है लिस्ट ऑन द स्टॉक एक्सचेंज विद लिस्टिंग कम्स रिकॉग्निशन इन्वेस्टर्स गेट इंटरेस्टेड इन यू एंड फंडिंग हैपेंस कम ऑन यार आई एम नॉट बिग इनफ टू लिस्ट चल लेट्स लीव अरे देयर इज अ स्टॉक एक्सचेंज एक्सक्लूसिवली फॉर योर काइंड ऑफ कंपनी एनएससी मर्ज इट्स अ राइट प्लेटफार्म फॉर योर बिजनेस रियली या माय काइंड ऑफ कंपनी एग्जैक्टली गेट लिस्टेड गेट रिकॉग्नाइज्ड अरे भाई हीरे की असली परख जोरी को ही तो होती है <laughs> चल एन एस सी मर्च साथ हमारा सफलता आपकी दी एस एम ग्रोथ प्लेटफॉर्म फ्रॉम इंडिया लार्जेस्ट स्टॉक एक्सचेंज दुबे जी मुंबई की बारिश देखने का शौक लेकर आए और लैंड करते ही फिसल गए अब शहर में नए थे और इनके पास नो जोनल कोपे वाला आईसीआईसीआई लॉम्बार्ड कम्प्लीट हेल्थ इंश्योरेंस को था नहीं हाँ। तो करें 
हमारे शहर का बीमा का था साठ हजार और यहाँ का खर्चा है नब्बे हजार वापसी के पैसे भी नहीं बचे जो था सब इस घुटने में घुस के आ गई बड़ा शहर बड़े खर्चे क्या बात कर रही हो भगवान भाग के दौड़ के कैसे वापस आ जाए घोटना टूट गया है अब जाओ और एफटी तोड़ो बड़े शहर के खर्चे की टेंशन नहीं इंश्योरेंस लीजिए आईसीआईसीआई लॉम्बार्ड कंप्लीट हेल्थ इंश्योरेंस देता है हेल्थ कवर के साथ नो जोनल कोपे का बेनिफिट ताकि आप अगर दूसरे शहर में भी हो तो आपके ट्रीटमेंट में कोई कमी ना हो आईसीआईसीआई लॉम्बार्ड कम्प्लीट हेल्थ इंश्योरेंस टेंशन नहीं इंश्योरेंस लीजिए व्हाइट शर्ट कितने प्लेन और सिंपल फॉक सेंट प्लेन और सिंपल व्हाइट शर्ट को बना दे स्पेशल और फैशनेबल फॉक सेंट New fashion wear for men. Welcome back. You're watching Indian Open on Bloomberg Quint. Now, as promised, uh, I think it's a discussion that I personally am really looking forward to have. Uh, Relegar is raising a little over 900 crore rupees from a clutch of investors led by Bay Capital. Uh, financial conglomerate now also has a new board led by professionals after Malvinder and Shivinder Singh decided to step down from the position at the helm. Maybe all of that has already led to investors believing that there is, uh, the, the, yet yes, there is a Relegar 2.0, but a revamped. And a better functioning Relegate 2.0 over the course of the next two or three years. To talk about all of that and more, and talk, tell us what what is in store uh, f to get the house in order. Is independent director at the company Vikram Talwar. Also, of course, joining me to talk about uh, take this conversation forward is my colleague Yatin Mota as well. Mr. Talwar, good morning, and thanks for speaking to us at Bloomberg Quint. Uh, I'm guessing it's a tough job at hand. Uh, what's the way ahead? What? What will Relegate 2.0 look like? We know that there are new directors, there is a hunt for a new CEO while an interim CEO is in place. The fundraising plan has been announced. But tell us all about Relegate 2.0. Uh, thanks, Neeraj, for having me on, uh, on, on the show. Um, this is, as you said a moment ago, a challenging job uh, for all the board directors that are being inducted onto the board. Uh, 2.0 is all about the redesigned, restructured uh, Relegare. It will be a company that is professional. It believes in absolute uh, uh, integrity. It will be meant for both the employees, the shareholders, and obviously the public, the customers. The professionalism that we want to instill in this company is the right processes, the right governance, both the spirit and the letter, and of course, the best management we can find. Big challenge, uh, without a doubt, uh, but I believe this can be done. It's an excellent franchise. It's a well-diversified financial services company. It has all the ingredients for success. All it needs is right management, good governance, and absolutely one of the most essential elements, a, a sufficient amount of capital to grow as well as to fill in the gap that we currently have. So I have a great uh, belief in the company. Uh, I wouldn't have taken on the role that I have if I wasn't. Uh, and I'm sure the others who have come on board, both the directors, but more importantly, the new investors, uh, would never have done that if they hadn't gotten full, full support of the, uh, of, the, of the employees, which I'm hoping will be there. Um, we had the occasion to talk to our senior management yesterday, and I can tell you they are an excellent lot of people, very committed, very loyal, and of course, very, very well professionalized in their business. Unfortunate events happened, but I'm sure we can eliminate the possibility of that going forward. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure, and, and we'll come discuss all of these things. I hope that gives uh, you a broad idea. Um, no, please carry on. Uh, yes, of course we can talk about, yeah, so sorry. Uh, as, as you probably know, Relegare has a, a, a group of companies underneath the holding company we have a, a large NBFC uh, with the, within which we have a good housing business. There is a health insurance business. And of course, there is a stockbroking business. 
And all of these are leaders in their businesses in, and, and are well known throughout the country. So you have the great infrastructure that you have. You have 7,000 excellent employees. And with that, con you know, with that kind of a franchise, all you really need to do is lead it correctly. And our intent is to find the right leadership. And with the right leadership, with the right direction, and very importantly, with the right governance to ensure integrity and ethics, I'm certain that we will make a, a really good um, uh, and, and a very, very successful company out of Rally Gear in the future. Mm. So, okay, two points that I want to pick off from your answer, uh, Mr. Talwar. One is you mentioned the need for funds, two, the need sure for the thing. right management. Uh, the, what's the hope? Is there a hope to get, uh, I mean, uh, uh, an eventual permanent full-time CEO by the end of the current financial, or is that too soon a timeline to predict? Well, uh, our intent is to start, we're starting a search for a, for a good CEO. A good, and a good CEO really means you're an experienced individual, someone who has turned companies around, has the excellent financial management skills, but more importantly is a good manager. Uh, as you can imagine, that's not an easy task. Uh, however, uh, we believe that it should possibly take us uh, between 90 to 120 days to get that person in place. Uh, you will, you know, you will see that uh, the person we get will be the right, appropriate person. The task is not easy. I do not make small promises like ones that I can't keep. Uh, yes, we will get somebody, but by the end of this financial year, around the corner, I think that's near impossible. Mm. Yeah, which I factored in, but which is I was trying to figure out whether that is the eventual uh, goal or no. Fair enough. Ninety to one hundred and twenty days. It's absolutely. It. it, it, it yeah, we hope. That's our expectation. Uh, we know there are good people out there. We know we can attract them. Uh, I know there's a lot of people out there that uh, have uh, the experience to do this. Uh, they need to have confidence in the board. I think with the new structuring of the board, uh, they certainly should get some of that confidence. Uh, we have, I have been personally through several of these turnarounds not just in India, but also overseas. Uh, so I have a fairly good idea of what we are looking for here. Uh, and we have a fairly good idea of what the game plan should be to get this done. So we're very hopeful that it will be. Okay. Uh, good morning, Mr. Talwar. This is Yatin also joining in from the research team. Uh, as you were mentioning earlier, uh, you know, Religare is a holding company for various businesses, out of which uh, you have, uh, or, or the previous promoters had decided to exit the healthcare uh, uh, insurance business and more importantly the broking business also. Uh, so I just wanted uh, to uh, know that uh, do those transactions stand or uh, uh, you know will uh, the new board uh, look at uh, restructure the business or probably renegotiate uh, the transaction which uh, the earlier promoters uh, had uh, you know entered into? I'm talking about the true so, north uh, and uh, as you uh, know we just took over transaction. the board. Uh, Yes, I know. I know. I, I'm, I'm aware of those. Uh, our intention is to relook at the, the entire structure. Uh, the sales haven't actually yet been consummated, as you probably know. Uh, we will certainly fulfill whatever commitments were made by the company in the past. However, uh, we certainly will relook at the terms to make sure that they are in the best interest of the company and the shareholders and the employees. Uh, I think it's important for us to have the chance to do that. Uh, in my personal belief and that of the other members of the board, uh, for an integrated holding company, financial services entity, you require all of these ingredients, uh, both the, the NBFC and the lending, as well as the support uh, and, and, and more horizontal functions of insurance, broking, uh, etc. So. Uh, it's something we need to look at. Uh, my personal view, and this is purely my personal view, I would like to, to continue to have these, uh, these services adjunct to what we do in the NBFC to be able to get that customer base that we currently have within the company, which unfortunately has not been leveraged. So as we cross-sell to these people, there is a huge amount of opportunity that the company will have to grow itself. Uh, just from within the customer base that it currently holds. So it is something we need to look at, we need to understand, we need to know what commitments have been made, and obviously we'll fulfill all the commitments there are. But as of now, we need to review that. And my personal view is we should keep them. 
Okay, sir, in case uh, the board decides to review, will there be any breakup fee that uh, would be uh, required to be paid by Relegate Enterprises uh, to Edelweiss or True North? I, I am not aware, look, okay. but like okay. I said, I, I'm not aware of any, but if there is, we will certainly look at it. Uh, but uh, let me re reassure you that we will do exactly what is required by the by commitments okay. made by previous management. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are here to make sure that governance is totally appropriate and uh, to, to do what is actually the right thing to do. Mm. Mr. Talwar, uh, I think uh, there are two, two aspects to Relegate 2.0, right? One would be the cleanup act, if I can loosely use that term, which would involve, I mean, you know, uh, you know head kind of responding to the SFIO probe, uh, which the news has just come out, recovering the debts, uh, the money from the erstwhile promoters, so on and so forth. Two would be uh, putting money into the new businesses and starting to make them work. Uh, how long does the cleanup act, to your mind, take before core business takes center stage? And is there any sense uh, that you can, or any light that you can throw about how, the, how could the cleanup act pan out as well? Would the new board pursue aggressively the recovery of the dues from all debtors, including the erstwhile promoters? So you've asked a, a series of questions here, so let me try and address them one at sure. a time. Uh, let me take the area of, uh, of, of, uh, of growth. The growth in the company is basically in the growth in the operating companies. Uh, the operating companies, obviously, to grow require additional capital. Uh, we have already, as we announced last night, uh, uh, approved the raising of additional capital. Uh, we believe that we have commitments uh, of de over 900 crores, a very large sum, if you can believe that, within the purview of the, of the current situation. It's subject to the normal regulatory approvals which we are applying for. Once we have that capital, we'll be able to recapitalize uh, the NBFC, which has some shortfalls there in terms of the requirements, and then put new capital into the other businesses to raise the ability to uh, grow these businesses, which in, them, in themselves are running very, very well, from what I'm told. I need to look into it a little more. But uh, from everything that I've heard so far, the other businesses are in good shape. Uh, they require more capital. We will instill more capital within those from the amounts of money that are being raised at this point in time. So we are going to move ahead with growth as soon as possible. Uh, these things do take some time, you'll appreciate. Uh, they're not done easily. Uh, there, is, there are regulatory issues. There are uh, issues of getting approvals. Our expectation is that in the near future, uh, and hopefully before the end of this financial year, we'll be able to put more capital into these companies and raise whatever is necessary to be done to make sure that the company has the growth, the employees have the resources, and the company shareholders see the growth happening over a, over a relatively short period of time. Mm. What? Uh, with regard to your other question about getting resources, sorry, go ahead, my no, apologies. No, no, the same thing. I was just uh, probably asking my second question. Getting resources and recoveries from the erstwhile letters, the promoters, as the case may be as well. R right. So obviously, you know, uh, every company has certain amount of bad loans, whether they're from, um, uh, you know, whether they're to, they're basically to customers that they've been made. Uh, obviously, there is no doubt in our mind that if there are issues with the loans which are yet to be seen and, and studied, and we're undergoing audits as we speak, we've instructed uh, uh, outside auditors to look at this portfolio and make sure that we identify every single loan which is not performing in the right fashion. And yes, we will go after anyone who owes money to the company. It is something that is our, 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 our fiduciary duty. We intend to fulfill it completely, and we will not spare the, any effort whatsoever to collect whatever we can from, from those borrowers who are uh, out there and have not repaid either their interest or their principal. So to answer your question in a one, one line, we're going after them. Uh, if I can just follow up a question, Mr. Talwar, I think in response to a Bloomberg story about $300 million, and I don't know if you are uh, in the ability to be able to reply to that, uh, I think the response that came in from Relegate was that replies have been adequate replies have been made to the Delhi High Court. If you can tell us a bit about that, I mean, uh, because the the uh, quote unquote allegation is that the money was siphoned off, uh, but we don't know the stand that the new board has on that amount. 
Well, I'm unfortunately not that close to it as yet. We, we are still looking at it. I think it would be un, uh, untimely and inappropriate for me to comment on that at this point in time. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, uh, you know, uh, since uh, the new uh, board is uh, under, uh, uh, you know, uh, construction, uh, if, may I, if I may put it uh, that way, uh, but uh, if you could tell us, is there any communication uh, recently that you have received from RBI, SEBI, or investigation, uh, 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 you know, agencies? Uh, because, uh, you know, the news reports are full of uh, allegations and, you know, uh, uh, you know, there have been reports about siphoning of uh, money in various uh, related subsidiaries. But if you could tell us in the recent past or probably in the last, uh, you know, 10, 15 days, is there any written communication that the company has received from regulators, including SEBI and RBI? Uh, you know, I saw that article in the press myself yesterday. I, I have gone back and checked with everybody in the company that I can find with have any uh, appropriate uh, position. I'm informed uh, with confidence that nothing has been received as of now. Uh, the moment we receive these things and within the, within the purview of our legal advice, we will let the market know. Uh, however, at this point in time, I am assured that there is nothing uh, that we have received from any government agency for any special investigation, other than the normal uh, look that the Reserve Bank does. But other than that, there's absolutely nothing that we've received that I'm aware of. Okay. And so one final question, at least from my side, is regarding an open offer. Uh, since, you know, we have a new management coming in, uh, you know, the, uh, the probable definition of control, uh, uh, you know, probably triggers an open offer. And more importantly, uh, you know, uh, Bay Capital is something which is seen as uh, running the entire operations that's relegated, at least that is the market talk. Uh, if you could uh, give us uh, clarity as to is there any open offer uh, which could get triggered, especially after the conversion of warrants, or uh, is there any uh, investor who is willing to be classified as a promoter and, uh, you know, running the operations uh, and probably looking at an open offer uh, or something of that sort uh, so that uh, minority investors uh, and their interests are protected? Uh, nothing that I'm aware of at this point in time. I'm not aware of any open offer. Nothing has been brought to the board. Uh, there is no discussion in that, uh, in that area. And we don't look at anyone, any one particular entity or individual being a promoter of this company. We want the, the stock holding to be diversified. We want this run as a professional organization uh, without any single person having control on it. So uh, that's our intent. There is nothing on the table, I assure you. Uh, uh, and, and we believe that this is the best way to, to ensure the, uh, the, the security and the growth and the value for the minority shareholder, rather than to get promoters in who, uh, who necessarily don't always uh, look at the minority shareholder with the same uh, professionalism that they require. Mr. Talwar, one final question. Uh, usually, when a new board and a management comes in, yes, uh, people tend to expect a V-shaped recovery, but we know that business doesn't recover in that fashion. Uh, would you believe that uh, Relegate 2.0 will see a gentle U-shaped recovery where an FY19 could be a year of consolidation before growth picks up? Or do you believe that uh, there is ample opportunity for a sharp uptick uh, from the lows that we are at in, in terms of pure business for Relegate? So, sir, let me, let me assure you that we are not here to show sudden growth, uh, quick profits, uh, and, and, and try and, and, and display bravado. Uh, I'm a firm believer in setting the base and the foundation. The board currently is totally in, in sync with that. I think we were going to do this the right way, which is the, the first uh, former mention that you had, which is basically build the foundation, get the right people, get enough capital, and grow this business once we've consolidated it in the right fashion, understood the risks, and then <clears throat> grow the business in such a manner that we get better returns. But that's not a short-term measure. That is certainly a longer-term uh, strategy. Now, I'm not talking about five years, but it's certainly not one year. So hopefully, uh, we will see uh, the following year, 2021, uh, as something that we can look forward to great growth in the company. And we are confident we can deliver that. Yeah, everybody has been watching this one, certainly hopes for that as well. I'm sure minority shareholders hoping for that too. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Mr. Talwar, for joining us today and giving us some clarity. Uh, we look forward to talk to you uh, at some point of time in the next uh, three or six odd months as well. 
Thanks a lot, Neeraj. Thanks, Yadi. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. To you too. Thank you so much. Okay, um, that's um, Mr. Talwar speaking about how Relegate 2.0 could look like. Whatever little clarity that he could give, uh, but understandably, there's not much uh, uh, in terms of uh, the recoveries or otherwise that he can talk about. Uh, nevertheless, the stock uh, marginally off in the session today. The other set of uh, uh, con conversations that we want to do uh, was with uh, companies in the in the consumer space. Now, it could be consumer durables, it could be autos and otherwise, but we thought it's best to talk with the consumer durables, electrical consumer durables company, uh, which had a fairly decent quarter, and to take stock of how, or rather, take a sense of how calendar year 18 could shape up. To talk about uh, Bajaj Electricals and the future plans and the FY19 in calendar year 18, is that joining us is the chairman and managing director, Mr. Shekhar Bajaj. Mr. Bajaj, good having you. Thanks so much for taking the time out and being with us. Uh, you know, we didn't get a chance to talk to you post your numbers, but if you can start off with how you thought quarter three went by, because it was chalk and cheese for companies within the consumer space and the consumer durable space as well. How did you think your quarter was? How do you think the next three or four quarters are shaping up to be? Uh, I think the third quarter was the turnaround quarter, according to me, in terms of our bottom line. It's improved by about 24-25%, bottom line has improved. But the, now that the, our distribution model has been almost uh, completed, the whole uh, rollout has been over, our January numbers, which I have already given to the stock exchange also, we have shown uh, uh, both in EPC and in case of consumer product, there's a growth of almost 29% in terms of volume. In terms of value, it'll be 18%, 19% because there's a 10% D, uh, because of the GST, our realization is lower by 10% because we get a set off. But uh, in, in the coming months also, now that the rollout is there, we can look at a double digit growth coming in this quarter and in the coming year, clearly a double digit or a little more than that also can be expected. The main advantage that we are finding is that the distribution is in place. The negative uh, which we had suffered in the last two years because we had stopped wholesaling and doing only distribution is now in place. So now it's fully distribution, hardly any wholesaling and therefore to that extent there's no negative backlash because of stopping wholesaling. Mm. You would reckon, Mr. Bajaj, that the volume growth, and it was a seriously good volume growth that you posted in quarter three, the quantum can be maintained? Or was this an exceptional volume picture because of the uh, demonetization quarter base that you had? And going forward, there will be a good number, but a normalized number. No, the third quarter numbers were not very exciting. The bottom the line was impro improved because uh, of a uh, volume has not gone up much, uh, but the uh, fourth quarter onward, we expect a much better volume. Uh, as I said, in January, we have grown by, uh, in terms of volume, by 29%, both in EPC and consumer product. I don't think 29% can be maintained, but 15 to 20% uh, uh, growth can be uh, maintained, not only in this fourth quarter, but in the coming year also. Uh, 15 to 20% growth is very much likely because our distribution is in place. In fact, most people believe, Mr. Bajaj, that you would be on track by the end of the current financial to achieve almost 90% coverage via new distribution, and that will set the stage for the consumer business to grow, as you said, maybe 15%, maybe 20%. No changes to those timelines, I would presume? No, I think it may be even better. But let's keep it to 15, 20%, I think is a reasonable growth expectation because we have to gain back our lost market share. Mm. If the market is growing by 10%, we have to grow by 20%, then only we'll be able to recover our lost market share in the last two years because we have stopped wholesaling, others took our market share, we have to get it back. Mm. Okay, uh, does this also play out, I would guess the answer is yes, but I just wanted uh, an affirmation from you. Does this also play out in how your operational picture would look like because that too, uh, I, I guess, has suffered a bit. Do you think that uptick out there is in place and what's the extent of operational upticks do you believe would happen over the next couple of years? I mean, how much can you, can you as a company take your margins up to from the current uh, six, six and a half that you clocked in in the quarter at least, if not the year? 
uh, absolutely. Uh, one other thing which happened in the last two years, especially, is because uh, we wanted to improve our distribution, so the cost went up. But our sales, because we were looking at secondary sale and not uh, push sales, we were looking at pull sales. So our primary sales showed either flat or negative growth. And therefore, our percentage of fixed cost went up substantially. In the coming year, it will be exactly the reverse. Our fixed cost, because already the distribution is in place, our fixed cost will not go up as fast as our sales growth will take place. And therefore, our fixed cost percentage will continuously keep coming down. And therefore, the EBIT margins or the bottom line operating profits will go up. Not necessarily because we are increasing our pricing, but our fixed cost will come down in terms of percentage in the coming, uh, this quarter and in the coming year. Yeah, we just thought so what you are saying is correct, that we are expecting our bottom line in the consumer product, yes. Yes. Okay. And, and sorry, just one last question on the consumer business. So you would believe, I mean, at least the market believes that there is a high probability with all of these events happening that your return ratios improve dramatically. I mean, northwards of 20, 22% ROC, ROE over the course of the next couple of years from the current 15, 16%. Realistic assumption, sir? Uh, see, I'm saying that it's rather let it happen. Okay, fine. We are very positive and optimistic. And what? Okay, okay. So let's wait for the print. You are optimistic, is what I guess you're saying. My final question to you, sir, is that's on the contracting business. We've spoken at length about the consumer business. The contracting business, uh, again, the assumptions are that uh, there could be a steady state 15% compounded annual growth rate over the next couple of years on that, uh, on that side of the business. Realistic, you think? It's quite realistic. On the other hand, it may be a little higher only because we have got order book of over 3,000 crore. And therefore, whether we like it or not, if we don't have that 15, 20% growth coming in in the next couple of years, uh, we will have LDs and we'll have problems. So we have to complete our projects that we have taken. And therefore, uh, growth of 15 to 20% is very realistic and very much going to take place. I'm sure about that. In consumer product, the market will decide. As far as EPC is concerned, order book decides. So we have sufficient orders to execute. And therefore, here there's more certainty of growth of 15 to 20%. If all of this is to happen, Mr. Uh, Mr. Bajaj, and this is my final question to you, if all of this is due to happen, uh, there is probably no reason why your bottom line growth, because of your margin expansion, because of the fixed cost being the way they are, there's no reason why your bottom line growth and the earnings would, would probably not double over the next two, two and a half to three odd years. Uh, you, 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 think, you think you're working with those numbers, earnings or the bottom lines, uh, almost doubling over the next two years? I, that's a very tall question which you're asking. The margins will definitely improve, the bottom line will definitely improve, but whether it will be double in two years, only time will show. I mean, as far as we are concerned, uh, we are working towards trying to improve our margins, improve our profitability, uh, reduce our costs, and uh, we hope that the result will be uh, improved profitability. And that's why the market has reacted very positive in the last three months. Uh, the uh, prices have substantially gone up. I think people are expecting good performance. Mm. Okay, great. Mr. Bajaj, thank you so much for taking the time out and speaking to us at Bloomberg Quint. All the best for this quarter, and we look forward to talking to you post your next quarter numbers as well. That's a very optimistic Mr. Shekhar Bajaj of Bajaj Electricals, rightly so. By the way, the markets have done reasonably okay for themselves in the last 30 minutes, uh, about a third of a percent higher for the Nifty and the Sensex. Sensex actually 0.4%, just that the Nifty Bank is lagging a bit. But with that, it's a wrap on this leg of Indian Open. Up next is the FNO Show. Stay tuned to Bloomberg Queen.